So we all understand that increasing technology innovation, advancements in geospatial technology are making a kind of big wave across industries, across every economic sector. And logistics and supply chain may be one of the most impacted sector. But the very uh, important fact to understand is the notorious, uh, this sector is very notorious for a uh, heavy use of panel process till date and a large amount of data that is being generated or they have is stored in a different way in a different places so the logistics and supply chain industry has perhaps the most to gain from geospatial knowledge and integrating it in its workflow so can we go to the next slide Well, I think so. Slide change is taking a bit of time. So we all know that uh, a comprehensive uh, geospatial model takes a kind of guesswork out of this decision making process that is there in an organization and it enables company executives and the people uh, which are there in the organization to step out from their departmental silos and integrate all the departments together to and consider uh, changes in a holistic fashion, which helps avoid, you know, the danger of uh, sub optimization where the change in one area adversely affects another department. So one application where geospatial plays an important role today is in risk management or is valuable in real time uh, planning. Another application or uh, is of, you know, map movement inside facilities to do a kind of pattern analysis. But the biggest challenge with the sector is the lack of standardization, which I have spoken earlier in terms of all the different data sources that are coming in. So can we go to the next slide? And this uh, challenge has been more aggravated when the world faced this pandemic that we are seeing currently. So the global COVID-19 pandemic actually triggered a simultaneous demand and supply shocks to the global economy, disrupted the entire businesses of as well as government and consumers across the sector. And the crisis had opened many eyes in, uh, in terms of the importance of adding as much location intelligence as possible, and especially in this sector of supply chain and logistics network. So where uh, they stretched to their limits and hindered uh, like by delays, the logistics providers were overbooked and overworked, and this actually triggered the entire need for this uh, integrating location intelligence into the system. And in addition to these, um, that we have faced in the global pandemic, also the uh, facing globalization, increased product complexities and heightened you know, customer demands are some of the trigger points that the companies are taking up this advanced technologies to transform their entire supply chain from a pure operation hub into an epicenter of business innovation. So can we go to the next slide? So there is also very important to understand some of the industry trends that are currently prevalent in the in this sector, as well as some of the technology trends. So to have this uh, deep insight, uh, let's understand some of the driving forces in the sector. So first and foremost is the rise of digital freight uh, platform, which has the potential to increase the efficiency of freight transport by connecting more available capacity with shippers or uh, logistic companies and improving its utilization. The second is the collaborative robotics where more solutions are becoming interoperable such as collaborative robotics can communicate with each other uh, across different activities. E-commerce has changed the profile of shipment altogether. There has been a massive advancement in this technology integration. So re recent years we have seen um, advancements uh, in technologies like artificial intelligence, augmented intelligence or advanced analytics, automation, just to name a few. 
So, and also one of the uh, significant factor that is the prevalent in this or the trend that is that we see in the industry, which has the biggest impact on the business model, I would say, is the growing industry newcomers, the startup, which are actually shaping the future of logistics by emerging business models. So every organization has to, you know, um, have a kind of uh, drive towards the new business model in terms of making them grow or, uh, uh, you know, thrive in this industry. Uh, can we go to the next slide? So technology is changing the way we deliver goods and services definitely, and it is said that uh, we need to be ready for bigger changes with innovation as well as integration. So there cannot be one standalone technology that can be you know, applied to a, any sector. It is the combination and the integration of different technologies. So over the past several years, the logistics industry has started you know, integrating artificial intelligence, but that's just only the beginning. So even digital twin is possibly one of the most exciting uh, you know, technology in the logistics area where trends uh, to keep an eye on this um, development. So the potential usage of digital twin would be very far, vast in this uh, entire logistics and supply chain. Even real-time data is now more in demand by customers and the careers even more, which uh, means that logistics and supply chain enterprises need to focus on implementing this cutting edge solution into their operations. How do they integrate the system so that they can have the real time data? Blockchain definitely is one, but uh, currently it is a kind of biggest buzzword. So we'll have to see how the trend goes on. Autonomous vehicle. Yes, it has got a very you know, significant impact in terms of technology in the logistics sector, but still it is in a kind of trial stage and we have to likely to see how it comes up. Very important, which is a kind of, I would say, a technology trend which needs to be catered and taken care of in this segment is data standardization and advanced uh, analytics wherein traditionally data in the logistics industry has always been you know, completely siloed, as I told previously. So need is to create a common information technology standards for you know, digitization and also interoperability in an effort to make this entire sector more efficient for both you know, customers as well as the logistics lines that are there. Can we go to the next slide? So all these technology trends that we have seen uh, generates humongous amount of data uh, in the sector and almost 80% of the data be it coming from say IoT or any other form um, has a location component to it. And business can benefit significantly by integrating geospatial technology in their workflows with the allied technologies. So they can enable, you know, reconfigure the entire supply chain planning and fulfillment ecosystem and help organization to drive continuous growth and also to have an optimization of the resources that they are putting in into that will that is the it will have a maximum ROI to it. And this will enable them to shift from the sequential to the concurrent planning, the real time planning. It will also be a kind of pivot to optimize supply of resources and labor, as well as automate the processes, improve operational flow and a kind of process model processing, and more so in creating a kind of synchronized planning and fulfillment ecosystem that is currently uh, missing in this sector. Uh, next slide, Supriya. So what lies ahead is uh, a kind of scenario uh, which is currently underway in terms of geospatial technology integrating in the workflow, but there, what is ahead from here is what we'll see in our next slide. So we have seen that there are lots of uh, a huge amount of data being generated only processed uh, inefficiently and there is a lot of inefficiency both in the utilization of capacity in this area uh, such as the last mile that we say and the requirements of standards is ever increasing but 
There's also a fact that data itself today is not an answer. So having a data is not an answer to whatever solution or the questions or the query that uh, any organization is having. So industry is looking at for a knowledge service that is moving from the data value chain to the knowledge value chain. And this data ecosystem and real time analytics where the geospatial knowledge infrastructure sits or comes in place. So uh, I'll just uh, play one short video, which will give you a snapshot of GKI um, or geospatial knowledge infrastructure, what it is and what it intends to talk about. Volume, please. Supri, so, you're on mute. That's why we are not able to hear you. Uh, yeah, Anamika, just a second. The four. The fourth industrial revolution and allied technologies like big data, artificial intelligence, 5G, advanced robotics, miniaturization, etc. are driving new behaviors, collaborations and policies, thereby leading to unprecedented social changes. The digital ecosystem is evolving by integrating a variety of data sources, including real-time data, improved analytical capabilities, and by moving from data to knowledge services to solve real world challenges. The evolving digital ecosystem challenges the geospatial sector to transition into the 4IR era and raises the need for a next generation geospatial infrastructure that embraces automation, dynamicity, and real time delivery of knowledge. Geospatial Knowledge Infrastructure, or GKI, aims to provide the critical geospatial component to knowledge and automation, and thereby position geospatial in general purpose technology at the heart of 4IR and knowledge economy. It encompasses data, technology, policy, and people to ensure smooth provision and use of geospatial intelligence and knowledge to the broader ecosystem. GKI strives to ensure geospatial is everyone's business by developing a next generation interconnected platform where geospatial data from different disciplines, formats, and organizations are integrated in an organized and usable manner, thereby developing a geospatial enabled decision support system. So if we see the main essence of the geospatial knowledge infrastructure in the context of logistics and supply chain industry is providing geospatial knowledge to organization that is integrated with four IR technologies, bringing a loop of data to the national infrastructure, contributing to the national goal. Uh, I would say GKI will certainly upend, upend the traditional way of business, the way businesses has been done. So it will provide the power of location technology to significantly, you know, boost productivity, increase efficiency, and give companies better vis visibility and forecasting ability. And as this, um, uh, with this, everyone uh, else logistics company today, what we see are becoming also a kind of big data company. If you'll agree with me that today they have a humongous amount of data lying in their organization in a structured and unstructured manner. So as well, there are lots of data generated in-house. This means that lots of opportunity for technology professionals as well as entrepreneurs to seeking to make their own imprint in a way of delivering that data, enriched that data, and can be integrated with the national data frame 
um, for you know developmental goals. So this uh, and definitely there will be some financial models attached to that data, and that will also change the scenario of the business models that are currently prevalent because the thought process will be a bit different. So yes, it is important to know that presently it is a concept. This GKI is a concept and not an infrastructure currently. So. And this concept has been conceptualized to understand um, how the next geospatial technology or people or data would be there to enhance the economy, society or the environment. So this is just right now at the conceptual phase. So if we go to the next slide. Uh, and this conceptual, uh, you know, concept that we are talking about the GKI is a kind of three year project um, that is named as advancing role of geospatial knowledge infrastructure in world economy, society and environment. And this is in collaboration from uh, organizations from government, industries, nonprofit organization, and it is in collaboration with United Nations Statistics Division and Geospatial World with host of co companies which were there in phase one because phase one we had started this project last year and this is the phase two of the uh, project. So this seminar is actually part of the phase two of the project wherein we are working towards connecting the user community to understand the current state of adoption of uh, geospatial and allied technologies, the integration of that in their workflows, to develop you know, understanding of the relevance and value of this uh, geospatial knowledge, to even to discuss the evolving role uh, in the entire data ecosystem and understanding the you know, collaborative or partnership models that are currently there and what kind of uh, you know, partnership models would be coming up uh, in coming days with the government data agencies. So as I said that even logistics companies are a big data owners today. So with this, I hand over the floor to John Kidar, the strategic advisor of geospatial infrastructure from Geospatial World to present to you the details of geospatial knowledge infrastructure and its relevance to the logistics and supply chain industry. John, the floor is yours. Right, good afternoon, morning, evening. Um, wherever you are now, hopefully you can see my uh, my slides um, and we'll go on to full screen uh, to make life easy. Now, um, Anamika, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, and one thing that I've learned um, over the last year where we've started to look at this idea of geospatial knowledge infrastructure is no one, no one person um, can grapple with the complexities of what we're trying to achieve here. Um, and I'll come back to that um, in, a, in, in a minute in this presentation, um, because this this discussion that we're having today is absolutely a two way discussion um, without any doubt. And I'm just going to give you a little bit of the, I suppose, the conclusions of our thinking um, last year in the first year of the project as we sort of conceptualized the geospatial knowledge infrastructure. And let me up front tell you, you know, COVID's been a problem, hasn't it? Um, and in the logistics industry um, has grappled magnificently to keep supply chains running in very difficult circumstances and open new ones. Um, and I'll come back to obviously the vaccine supply chains. Um, but I think uh, where I want to illustrate um, the difference between the past and the future um, is by looking at the role of national mapping agencies. And in the past, they have produced maps and data. And of course, it is a data world and they produce data and they've done it with conventional mechanisms. Um, and of course, they're pushing boundaries now um, by using satellites, by using AI to, uh, feed, to, to auto generate the features and so on and so forth. It's incremental um, advancement. Um, but the other side of the coin is something that I know has been going on in the UK recently, uh, where the National Mapping Agency um, has worked with a utilities company. Um, that utilities company has had sensors on its vehicles that are linked to a third company. Um, in this case, it's Mobileye and the whole idea of using um, sensors on vehicles to capture 
um, everything to see, if you like, computer visualize the world around those sensors. So you have that sensor technology and the computing power that goes with it to extract features, to make decisions for automated vehicles. You have all of that. You have utility companies, vehicles, which drive all the streets most days. And you have a national mapping agency working together. Why? Because by using the data collected on those utility vehicles through that sensor technology and edge computing, the National Mapping Agency's database can be updated automatically by, um, by those vehicles driving around the streets or part of that database. And suddenly you have a complete change in the way we look at things. Suddenly National Mapping Agencies potentially can have up-to-date data, not, not six months, one year, two years, four years, five years old, but actually stuff that was captured in the last hours and days. So I'm illustrating that this is a step change and with GKI, with this geospatial knowledge infrastructure, we're trying to reflect that thinking. We're trying to think what is next? How does geospatial really enable users, whether they're businesses, whether they're consumers, um, get the best from geospatial. How do we enable people when they speak into their smartphones and ask um, you know, smart questions? Um, how do we enable that to actually inter um, to, to, to be able to interrogate geospatial databases? Because at the moment, of course, those geospatial databases cannot be interrogated in that way. Um, some can, most can't. So how do we get geospatial data right into the heart of the technology that we're using um, now every day? And that's geospatial knowledge infrastructure and what we're trying to achieve. So with that, let's let's um, move on. Um, it's a new world. Um, we need a new concept. Um, the geospatial world is absolutely changing. Um, and I've talked through some of that now, but there are sensors everywhere, everywhere you go, and facial recognition, um, and your smartphones are collecting data all the time. All around us, um, the world of data, um, location data, most of this with location associated is changing. There's far, far more geospatial information out there collected in different ways um, and available to um, society. Um, and at the same time, the user community is absolutely changing. As Anamika talked about the fourth industrial revolution, the user community is very different. I mean, who'd have thought 10 years ago that the finance sector would actually be interested in geospatial information, apart from trying to control fraud from ATMs. Um, you know, a card suddenly appearing on two sides of the world within 24 hours needs investigation. So, um, but, but now, of course, the financial sector makes heavy use of geospatial information. But the thing that's most important to us is automation. Um, in the past, there's always been a human to interpret geospatial information. Um, to make decisions. Well, of course, automation is taking us into a completely different place now, already has taken us into a different place. If you're in Phoenix, Arizona, you can get a driverless taxi um, uh, from A to B. Um, so automation is with us and in the logistics sector, um, very much part of our today and a much, 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 much greater part of our future. So users are changing. Um, and also geospatial is abs absolutely changing. So there's a load of companies. I could put many other companies up here. It doesn't really matter. The point is that they don't think in terms of geospatial um, anymore. They actually think in terms of data, analytics, user interfaces, and location plays a greater or lesser part in, uh, in all of that. And so geospatial from being a specialist niche that we all like to sort of protect and talk about the geospatial sector. It's not like that now, and it's going to be even less like that in the future. Geospatial is part of everyone's business. Um, you know, the very fact that just about everything that we carry with us in terms of smartphone technology or our vehicles that we drive around it have global um, navigation chips. They have GNSS chips in um, location data collected all the time. So geospatial is changing enormously. 
Um, if we take, and it doesn't matter what the figures are on here, data isn't just geospatial data. There's a wide range of different datas. This is due with digital cities, but it doesn't actually matter. Vast amounts of data in a digital city. Um, not all of it's location based, but much of it is location based. Another fact, the European Union really does try and value the amount of, of, of gross domestic product value that data actually has um, to industry, to nations across the European Union. You can see the figures there. Um, it's, it's significant and growing, and that's the whole point, it's growing. And that's the, that's the um, value of the data. But of course, we all know, don't we, that data has no value unless it's used to solve a problem. And that's where the world of the models, the apps, AI, um, location all come in to help turn data into something valuable. Um, and so this is why we are trying to get away from the idea of data infrastructures, because data is not where the value is generated. It is actually generated through that bringing together of a problem, bringing together of analytics, bringing together of data from many different sources, not just traditional mapping type data. Um, it, it, it's about that. And so geospatial knowledge infrastructure is about taking us from data to knowledge. Um, Elon Musk is quoted there, but we've used this diagram um, time and time again, and I think most people are familiar with it. Da data um, at the bottom turns to information, which is pretty much automated now, turns to knowledge, increasingly automated now that we can um, combine various applications, um, and of course some of them with AI, along with different data sources to generate um, to generate knowledge, to generate a real um, understanding. Um, and of course that drives increased value because the more we get away from data and towards knowledge, the more um, value we have, whether it's societal value, decision-making value, absolutely, or economic um, value. So that's where we're trying to drive things. We're trying to drive um, the geospatial community to think not of data, but to think of knowledge. Um, and we're trying to integrate the geospatial community with all sectors of um, industry and society. Now, the um, the digital road, we've called it. Um, you know, I, I'm unfortunately old enough to remember when I sat at my desk um, and I sent handwritten stuff to the typing pool um, and desk phones and meetings. And, and, and we all, rem well, no, we don't. Some of us remember those days. Um, but actually, we've moved rapidly over my lifetime, certainly, um, from left to right here. Um, and that's the digital environment. Now, the geospatial environment um, has moved very significantly too, from the days of paper and analog mapping um, right the way through to spatial data infrastructures, which is about giving specialists um, special data, so geospatial data um, available to people who've got the right tools to use it. Um, spatial data infrastructures. Um, the United Nations is trying to move this into all corners of the world through its integrated geospatial information management framework. The whole idea is, you know, it's all very well for me in Britain and, and for people in other parts of the world to talk about geospatial um, and how it can help. Well, the UN is trying to actually move it into those countries which um, have a lot of catching up to do. But the thing is, the geospatial community is still separate from that much wider digital community. And what we're trying to do with GKI um, is fill that next step and that next step deliberately trying to look at how we bring those two communities together because there isn't really a separate geospatial community now. We are all the data, digital uh, knowledge um, environment and location is one way um, that we help uh, make decisions and um, automate things and so on and so forth. Um, and for those of you who know the geospatial community, Jack Dangerman is probably one of the most famous names. Um, and he's saying the same thing. He's saying, you know, we in the geospatial community need to come together and think about what's coming next. We need to go faster. Um, so GKI is an attempt um, to get this moving in a different direction. 
Um, that's the spatial community today, geospatial community, the spatial data infrastructures, if you like. Um, and I'm being a bit cruel with this slide, with what I'm representing there deliberately, um, to extend to where we're trying to get to, which is much more analytic centric. And I don't mean geospatial information systems analytics. I mean all sorts of different an an analytical um, methodologies, um, much more cloud based and distributed. Um, thinking 4D um, and 5D, and for me 5D means sort of probability if you like, um, but the fifth could be other things as well. Um, much more user centric, focused absolutely on what the users need, want, uh, not what the geospatial people um, believe should be provided. Uh, much more dynamic, you know, the, the world is um, back to sensors everywhere, you know, the world is, is, is not working. Um, in years now, it's working in days, hours, minutes, and in the automated world, um, you know, seconds and milliseconds. So much more sort of dynamic thinking is needed, um, and so on and so forth. And, and that's really, GKI is trying to move us into that space. But it is conceptual, um, although there's work this year to start to actually turn that conceptualization into something a little bit more concrete. Um, and these discussions with sectors of industry are absolutely part of um, that process. So there is a vision um, and there is a definition for geospatial knowledge infrastructure. Who knows, they might well change um, through the year. But the vision is to try and put geospatial knowledge right in the heart of digital society, not to keep it separate. Um, you know, it, it, it's it's got to be seen as part of the digital whole um, and in a sense the knowledge infrastructure is um, part of of doing that so we wrote a paper last year white paper which um, I don't know hundreds if not thousands of people were sort of um, in workshops around the world and in, and in various other uh, fora um, give their for thoughts on various things and we tried to capture them um, and and produce a paper and we saw that there were a number of elements to a geospatial knowledge infrastructure. But first of all, I just want to point out that, you know, this is about governments, it's about industry, and it is about the wider digital ecosystem and the wider digital infrastructure, um, hence the circle around the outside. But the, the elements that we saw as needing to be tackled um, for from a geospatial knowledge infrastructure perspective, first of all, foundation data. Um, and I'm going to come on to each of these in, in, in turn in a second, so um, I, I'm not going to go into detail here. F foundation data, um, that is the, uh, if you like, the geospatial data that we're used to now. Um, it's the statistics data that we're used to, but perhaps with a geospatial element to it. Um, and, and various other foundation data sets, geospatial data sets, often that will be um, in some way government um, controlled in order to ensure there's a certain amount of authority to them um, for government use and so on and so forth. Um, partnership and collaboration, um, you know, no longer, as we've um, heard many times and we'll touch on more, can every business, um, every government work on, on its own. It just doesn't work like this in, in, in today's society. Um, and we'll explore why um, a bit later. Industry leadership, we've used the word leadership, but it's to try and show governments that industry has an absolutely vital part to play in the geospatial knowledge infrastructure. In fact, industry is leading the innovation that's going on here, not governments. Um, without doubt, it is industry that is, is, is driving the change for geospatial, um, and hence the term leadership. Um, the applications, the analytics, the modeling community, as we've said before, it's it's data plus those things that starts to provide knowledge. You can't separate them. They've got to work together. Each has got to communicate, talk, um, both from a digital perspective and, and from a people perspective um, to try and generate knowledge. Um, geospatial dimension to the wider digital ecosystem, I think I've, I've talked about. It's about moving geospatial right into everything else that's going on um, in the digital ecosystem. And integrated policy frameworks is really about governments, not writing geospatial policy in isolation. It's how you bring space policy, AI policy, um, uh, if you like, 
com commerce policy, logistics policy, how we actually tie those much closer together, because data crosses all of these boundaries. And you can't just um, think in terms of one small area now, and hence the word integrated. Now, I'll take a quick spin round um, most of these just to give you a quick flavour um, in, in a little bit more detail. But the policy framework I've just been sort of um, talking about to an extent. Um, and at the bottom of these slides, you'll see some of the sort of outcomes we're trying to get to with, um, with our discussions on this particular element. So you can see the outcomes there. I'm not going to, um, I'll, let, I'll let you read them um, as we go through. Um, and I've talked about why this is really important because um, discussions around open data, discussions around legislation uh, that might impact the ability of businesses to use location, um, the discussions around privacy and security, um, where does government focus its effort in research? Uh, and digital education, educating the workforce of the future um, in our schools and universities and actually in reality long beyond that. All of these are, are absolutely part of us moving forward and part of the integrated um, policy framework we've talked about. Foundation data is a basic. Um, and and Often the word authoritative is used, uh, and in my mind, there is a sense of authority here um, because um, you, you have to know what you're using comes with a certain stamp on it, um, stamp of authority. But for me, actually, it's the word trusted that I like best um, in this situation. It is the geospatial information. It is the reference framework, the actual global geodetic reference framework, the basis upon which all location is positioned, the basis upon which GPS and the wider GNSS um, um, satellites give us position on our smartphones. You know, there's a framework behind that. It's, it's hidden away. It happens. Um, but it has to be there. Um, we have to think about foundation data in not just the land domain, but the sea domain. Um, obviously, and, and for those logistics organizations transporting from sea, that, that goes without saying, doesn't it? Um, and so there's a range of different foundation data <coughs> that we need to consider. But most of all, we need to make sure it meets the user's requirements, it's kept up to date, <coughs> and it's available widely, accessible um, to uh, businesses, to government, um, to, to citizens. Um, that's foundation data. The next one I want to talk about is partnerships and collaboration. Now, we often talk about PPP, the collaboration between business um, and, and government, but in reality, it's partnerships between businesses. It's partnerships between uh, businesses and academia, businesses and government. It's a much, much wider range of partnerships here that we are talking about and the need to collaborate, <coughs> excuse me, on things geospatial. Um, and, and in particular, collaborative innovation, and I'll return to that um, shortly. Industry leadership um, really covers a number of issues. It's about growing the data economy. Um, it's about growing the value of data within business, um, as, as we've talked about earlier, growing that knowledge economy. Um, it's about investing, a private investment, um, and it will wider investment in really good new ideas. Um, you know, we've seen it in Silicon Valley, but not all those ideas come from Silicon Valley. You know, many of them come from other places. Um, and the picture here actually shows um, something in Singapore, a, an innovation center set up where geospatial is the bit that sort of joins um, different industries, startups and so on together to try and um, bring new ideas, new innovative businesses to the market. Um, the applications, analytics and modelling communities, um, without doubt. And, uh, and this is where we're seeing most of the automation um, happening. Um, and it's where we really are starting to see predictive analytics, um, simulation and so on and so forth. Um, how we tie that community and what they're doing um, and their applications together with data is, is, is part of GKI. Uh, and then the geospatial dimension to the wider digital ecosystem. Um, here we're really trying to build geospatial onto the digital ecosystem. You know, the World Wide Web um, and web technologies have been with us for a long time. 
And yet it's only in recent years that we've started to see the geospatial standards and the web standards people really start to work together to think about how to tackle this particular um, issue of geospatial on the web. And that's been a really positive step forward. Um, but we need to put geospatial right in there. Now, that can all be summed up in a diagram. I'm not going to go any further on that because what I'd like to do is just close by looking at logistics so, and not really to repeat what was said by Anamika. Um, but I just want to think about some of the challenges that we face in, in the logistics environment. Um, the rise of e-commerce, um, you know, first mile, last mile, all the rest of it. Um, but but actually, it, it's not just a rise. I mean, it's been a cliff edge that we've, we, we've driven up over the last year and a half. And I've seen some reports suggesting that e-commerce will be about 95% um, of um, commerce in um, in about 20 years time. <clears throat> now, I don't know whether that's true or not. I'm not an expert in that area, but it just shows this growing rise. Um, I've touched that with last mile delivery, um, always a challenge. Asset tracking, um, how we better track our assets. And there's pretty good work going on on that. Now, there's a couple of sort of examples in a second. The integration um, and coordination information sharing across partners. You know, a shipping port um, is handling uh, containers from many, many different um, uh, companies with different um, processes, potentially, um, and, and different data standards and so on and so forth. So all of that needs to be brought together and it's a challenge. Um, circular supply chains are starting to take hold. Um, we we know that, and it, it may be a great buzzword at the moment. But but the point is, um, we are starting to think in that those those words. Um, we clearly need to reduce costs. It's a very competitive environment. Automation automation is hitting, um, you know, logistics companies just as much um, as it is um, hitting you know the the, the consumer as it were. And we always think about cars, don't we? But what about sort of heavy goods vehicles? Um, what about shipping eventually? Um, drones is probably the one closest to um, to realization. Um, and drones is perhaps that sort of last mile um, delivery <coughs> um, in, a, in a sense. The automation of drones for some of that um, may, may well help our logistics supply chain processes. Um, there'll be increased regulation to deal with climate change uh, and clearly the move away from carbon um, emitting transport um, is, is one of those. Um, there's always disruption to transport networks. Uh, we've seen lots of it in recent years and some of it actually in UK is political um, even, not, not necessarily natural disaster. Um, staff and asset shortages. Um, and actually, there are, uh, I, I read, um, quite a supply shortfall, certainly in my country, United Kingdom, amongst um, those that really understand the supply chain um, and are able to help businesses optimize. And I'll close with a number of examples. Uh, FedEx, during COVID, um, using temperature aware sensors. Um, on COVID vaccinations, which we know is is absolutely vital to their their health, as it were, um, and location-based technology. So, so taking this this idea of of tracking much further, but then in partnership with um, a clouds analytics provider, um, FedEx uses its data and the data it's collected from its sensors. Um, and the partners analytics um, to look at the whole of the supply chain um, for, in this case, you know, COVID vaccines um, and try and predict delays or speed up shipments. And to take it to the other end, in, in India in particular, um, drivers spend vast amounts of time in this particular city stuck, stuck in traffic and that will impact, of course, logistics supply chains as well. But here we see um, a company, a geospatial company or known to us, um, TomTom monitoring real time traffic flow um, so that actually there's a much better um, means in this Indian city to speed up the flow of transport around the city because greater knowledge is known of real time traffic flows. Um, the traditional, more traditional use of um, GPS coordinates plugged into um, 
into display screens um, in order to understand where assets are and so on and so forth and make make decisions. Um, and uh, uh, looking ahead towards drones, um, here, here's a startup that is trying to look at and build unified traffic management platform for drone corridors. So it's thinking ahead to the busy city streets and how you have drones flying around above them um, with, uh, with with sort of automated drone corridors. Um, and all of that is the sort of thinking that's going on that will be supported by geospatial knowledge infrastructure. So to close then, um, I just want to ask the question about innovation because th this is why effectively we're all in this room together. You can incre incrementally innovate, I talked about that right at the beginning, or you can go with a recombinant um, innovation. Um, the one, one is great, you know, in your business you sort of get slightly better at everything you do. The second one is about the logistics business working with, let's say, the geospatial um, people we're talking about at the moment, um, or the data AI people, or whatever, and bringing ideas from completely different angles together to solve problems. Um, and those where the step changes are made. Um, and we're seeing much, much more of that now um, than the incremental innovation. It's, it's really taking hold. Um, and, you know, you can go back, if you're in the United States, there was something called America's Technology Highway in the 50s and 60s. Um, and I even remember the Digital Equipment Corporation, DC. But, of course, all that ended when Silicon Valley came along. And Silicon Valley, people communicated with each other. Businesses talked to other businesses in coffee shops and, and they exchanged ideas. And that enabled this far faster um, growth um, into the digital er era. Um, and in businesses, you know, do we have um, geospatial teams parked away in a corner somewhere um, doing geospatial stuff? Or actually, are geospatial analysts spread through different parts of the business, um, working with decision makers, um, working with other analytics, um, working with control rooms to try and see if there are new ways of doing business? Um, and it is better to be social than smart and, and I close with that because that's exactly the purpose of um, our getting together today is to be social. Um, the, the, the communication of ideas between us will be far better and far more constructive than you know one small organization trying to uh, come up with the answer. So thank you very much indeed for your time um, and Anamika I think it's back to you now. Thanks, John. Thanks for taking us through the concept of GKI and how this entire uh, knowledge infrastructure would be driving a change in the user industries that are there and more especially logistics and supply chain. So with this, um, let's hear out from Dr. Nedal Nasser, the section chief from USGS National Minerals Information Center, who will be talking about the connections between geospatial issues and the mineral commodity supply chain. So Dr. Nedal, the floor is yours. Great, thank you very much uh, for the introduction and the invitation to um, present at your workshop. Um, I really appreciate it. I think my talk is gonna be a little bit different than I think most talks at the workshop. It's gonna be somewhat of a, of a deep dive into a topic that perhaps not a lot of people are necessarily familiar with. So maybe the first question on your mind, you know, why should I care at all about mineral commodities? Um, and, and I'm gonna have a couple of slides describing that, but I think, you know, the drive towards faster, smaller, smarter technology has really accelerated the use of mineral commodities, especially some of the minor metals that we don't really think about. Um, so think about uh, gallium nitride in, in those 5G uh, networks, um, aluminum lithium alloys in your, in your airframes, um, super alloys for your jet turbines, um, stronger bridges for infrastructure, medical devices, and of course the big one that everybody's talking about these days, um, lithium ion batteries for the electrification of the fleet. So all these technologies are really using some of the more exotic elements of the periodic table to, to achieve the desired performance. And so at the National Minerals Information Center, we track information and data regarding the production and consumption of, of um, all of these commodities globally. 
and we try to understand what's going on uh, in these supply chains. Um, so I have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, geologists in, um, at the U.S. Geological Survey that are trying to understand what's going on in the ground and what might be there. Uh, my team of researchers is trying to understand really what's going on above the ground when these resources have been mined. Um, so a little bit more background. What we've seen is over the last couple of decades, the production of these uh, minor metals has really skyrocketed to meet the demand. Um, so this is pr global production uh, normalized to a value of one in 1975 on a log scale. So you see things that are maybe familiar to folks like zinc and molybdenum and bauxite where we get aluminum, you know, they're growing more or less at the pace of uh, global GDP. But some of these minor metals like gallium, indium, and rhenium are, are growing several fold more than that. Um, and these are the metalloids that are used in these high tech applications. Um, and it's uh, I didn't pick these completely at random. The the commodities that are in the yellow shades are, are byproducts of the commodities in the blue shades, meaning that there is no such thing as a gallium mine. Uh, you get gallium as a byproduct of bauxite. You get indium as a byproduct of zinc. You get rhenium as a byproduct of molybdenum, which is often a byproduct of copper. And so there is significant complexities in, in their supply, potentially being inelastic to demand signals. Uh, but I think the bigger concern that we're facing is the fact that production is highly concentrated in a few countries. Uh, so looking at across the periodic table of elements, this is each country's share of global production. So you can see South Africa dominates some of the platinum group metals. Uh, the Congo is famously known for its cobalt and tantalum, Brazil for its niobium, um, Chile for rhenium and uh, iodine, and China pretty much has um, a lot of everything else. And this is a relatively new phenomenon. So this is the same data for China, um, um, but now looking time series from 1990 to 2018, and you can see its share of global production has, has risen quite dramatically. And so what we try to do is really understand the flow of these commodities from the mines, through uh, the processing, through manufacturing use, and ultimately end of life recycling to look at you know opportunities and um, concerns regarding these supply chains. Um, so this specific example is for tantalum, which is famously used for uh, electronic capacitors, used in everything from cell phones to um, laptops to any consumer electronics. Most of it is mined in the Great Lakes region in, in, in Africa, Central Africa, and then processed elsewhere. Um, the flows uh, that are shown here in the Sankey diagram are showing the magnitude of, of the quantity of contained tantalum at the, at the different stages and, and the recycling flows going back. Um, so the idea of circular economy and understanding how much is actually being recycled versus being lost at the different stages. But what this has shown is for global flows, um, we try to understand it as well um, you know, spatially a little bit. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the data that we have for trade, for example, um, from, uh, you know, specific agencies within the countries um, aggregated by the United Nations or Global Trade Atlas or other third party um, commercial software vendors is really aggregated at the country level and perhaps as as well as um, as can be at the port level. So it's we don't really have a good sense of where the commodities are, are really flowing except at, at the level of an individual country and perhaps at, at the port level. Um, and in some cases, some of these minor metals, as you can see here under this trade code, combine several different commodities, tantalum, niobium, and vanadium, uh, all together in one code at, at this um, uh, six-digit level um, that's accepted across all countries. So we really lose a lot of uh, resolution in terms of understanding the flows of these mineral commodities at the very beginning of the supply chain. So these are ores and concentrates that still go through many, many um, stages in the supply chain. So, you know, the question is, you know, can we get better uh, spatial resolution, temporal resolution to try to understand what is going on with these mineral commodity supply chains that are needed for these high tech applications? Um, you know, one way we've been thinking about it and one concern, of course, is, you know, a lot of these, you know, why would you care about this? Well, um, there's a study by the Energy Information Administration looking at maritime choke points that may disrupt supplies for oil and gas. And obviously, um, some maritime choke points like the Strait of Hormuz or Strait of Malacca are a big deal for oil and gas. So the question is, okay, that's the case for fuel minerals. What about some non-fuel minerals that we might care about? 
um, like lithium and rhenium from Chile or, or tin from Peru or rare earths from China. And so perhaps we could use some transponder data from, you know, to get ship level data regarding build of lading and the transportation routes to understand, you know, where are these flows going geospatially uh, to understand, are there maritime choke points that we should be worried about? Uh, whether, um, you know, we, we saw the incident in the Suez Canal a couple months ago, um, the disrupted supplies, this is information that's, that would be really helpful to know where are the bottlenecks and the choke points in in the in the in the maritime um, trade of of these mineral commodities? Now, one thing that we've been trying to do at the U.S. Geological Survey is to try to develop some of the basic information regarding um, mineral production and processing facilities and the related infrastructure. So, this is some work that we did with the Inter-American Development Banks for Latin America, uh, look at, trying to um, develop. Uh, comprehensive information uh, regarding the location um, and and capacities of uh, mineral production facilities, um, as well as exploration sites, mineral resources, related infrastructure, electricity generation and, and transmission, oil and gas pipelines, et cetera, to have all in one standardized um, data uh, place, um, database. Um, of course, what this requires is a lot of manual effort um, as we as as the previous uh, speaker talked about um, you know that's that's not where we need to be we need to be able to automate a lot of this so that we can have um, much more um, recent information um, that can be continuously updated in a format that's directly usable um, so one way that we've been thinking about it um, well, before I jump to that, you know, how how would you use this information? Well, one thing that we're looking at is um, supply disruptions, right? So where could supply disruptions come in? Well, if you have the information regarding location and capacity and you tie it into other geospatial data, such as data on natural hazards from our, our earthquake hazard folks at the USGS, we can understand, um, you know, what is the potential to disrupt supplies, in this case, copper supplies in South, South America, um, and what is the impact of those disruptions to to the global markets? Um, so with this information can be very useful if it's accurate and up to date. Um, so one way we potentially could improve our data collection methods, which are currently based on uh, surveys that are completely voluntary um, and requiring a lot of manual processing of that information, is to try to automate a lot of this information. Um, in this case, the example that I have here, is using remote sensing techniques. This is a, a company that uh, forced to provide real near real time information regarding copper smelters worldwide um, using remote sensing uh, satellites to try to understand the activity that's going on in the ground and then translating that information into um, uh, you know activity of of those copper smelters worldwide. So this kind of automated information can really um, not necessarily replace, but at least definitely supplement um, the other data gathering techniques that we have to understand the activity at specific at, at the asset level, not just at the at the national level. Um, and, and that information would be tremendously useful. Uh, I'll bring one example, one more example before um, before concluding here. Um, everything that I've talked about so far is is really about the flows of, of mineral commodities. Uh, but it's also important to understand the stocks, right? So how much uh, resides where. So um, this is a, a paper from over a decade ago from a, a former colleague on, on the left, um, looking at the copper resources in the ground, right? So these are uh, geological resources versus what where copper resides above ground. So this is copper in your uh, in your houses, in your electronic devices, and trying to spatially resolve where these resources are. So basically, human activities mining these resources and then spreading them out throughout uh, throughout the globe. Um, and we've been trying to um, find additional techniques to be able to do that. The way um, this researcher was able to do it using um, you know night nighttime lights. Um, and, and economic data and material flow information, we're able to see the change of uh, in use stocks over time. Um, and so this information is is helpful. It can, I think, definitely be improved. Well, how, how is it helpful, you might ask? Well, it, understanding where uh, these resources are above ground can definitely inform um, policies regarding recycling. 
So if you know where your copper is, you know where your indium is, you know where your gallium is, you have a better sense of how difficult will it be to um, collect it. Um, where does it really concentrate? Where does it reside? Just as you would need that information for um, below ground resources uh, to, to mine copper, for example. And so there's a lot to be done in this area. Uh, we're still just scratching the surface. Um, but if there's a little bit of time left, I'll, I'll stop there and happy to entertain a few questions if there's time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nadal, for uh, taking us through this uh, comprehensive information regarding uh, you know, mineral production and extractive industry that you have been working on. So it was really interesting to understand this uh, entire geospatial issues and the mineral co commodity supply chain. So uh, with this, we come to an end of the opening session. And we are positioned to start our next session. So we have seen previously number of 4 IR technology and its integration having value proposition and impact on logistics and supply chain industry. And that too integrated with geospatial technologies, which is providing intelligent transportation, route planning and demand planning and their operations for improved future operations. So our next sec section of the agenda will highlight the importance of adoption and integration of geospatial and the 4IR technology. So let's hear from our esteemed speakers on their views on current state of adoption and integration of geospatial knowledge platforms and 4IR technology for data analysis and knowledge creation. And for this, we have uh, sec for this session, we have three speakers. But before I hand over the floor to speakers, uh, I would uh, like to mention that um, post the presentation from the speakers, the floor will be open for panel discussion. And we would like the participants to encourage them to ask questions and have a kind of good interaction with them. So. Not to delay further, I would uh, invite Justin uh, Godson, the PhD from TEDx speaker and a professor of uh, project and supply chain management from Penn State University to take the stage and present his views. Hi everyone, hi everyone, and uh, thank you for, for attending this discussion. And and in terms of in terms of the current in terms of the current state, you know, of from a supply chain perspective, I want to to essentially expand on expand on John's presentation um, that 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 he that he delivered, which was which was an, an amazing presentation. And some of the things that some of the things that you know, I would like to just summarize the current state that we have to. We have to go to what we refer to as visibility, collaboration, and communication among all stakeholders within within um, the supply chain network. All right. Now, moving on, moving on to the presentation. I think that whenever we whenever we're moving to this 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 Web three world, you know, I talk a lot about web a lot about Web three. You know, and I always say that, you know, my definition of Web3 is the integration between artificial intelligence, blockchain and the Internet of Things, right, among among other things. But but that's my that's my that's my research area. So I, I, I typically uh, discuss discuss those three, you know, and as we as we move into this into this Web3 world. We're going to have to we're going to have to move outside of the voice of the customer and move to the voice of the business partner. Right? How can we? Why? How can we increase the integration? How can we increase the visibility among among throughout our supply chains? Right? And 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 I think that you know we're going to continue to see supply chain disruptions within within the industry, and because of that, I think that we're going to have to we're going to have to to John to John's point. You know, we're we don't we don't we don't we don't you know we don't have to continue to just collect data. We have to actually leverage that data. We have to leverage that data. We have to run simulations. We have to be proactive in in 
you know, future disruptions that may that may arise in the near future. Right. And we have to share that information with our business partners. Right. We cannot keep that that data and that information within our four walls. We have to share it if some if we see something that may potentially emerge. So, you know, that's one thing where we could leverage. We could leverage AI to 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 run continuously run models uh, to see if if, if 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 these AI tools would be able to uncover to uncover um, thing potentials potential supply chain disruptions in the near future. Um, also, whenever he, whenever he's return he's referring to the asset tracking aspect. You know, we have to to leverage to 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 leverage a, a IoT and blockchain, right? To increase the transparency, not not only among business partners, but among 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 the you know uh, consumers as well. So so there's not there's I think that you know the future is going to hold essentially the most important piece is going to be the integration. It's going to be the integration. And it's going to be to continuously to 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 look at the voice of the business partner, along with the voice of the customer. Thank you. Thanks, Justin, for your views. Uh, may I invite? Uh... Kijin Van Zick, the co-founder and CEO from Charge Trip, to present his views. Yeah, and thank you so much for having me. Um, let me just see if I can turn my camera on. I feel like uh, I'm a little bit out of my depth in this uh, in this forum, especially listening to uh, the last three presentations. Um, so, but maybe we can offer a little bit of insights on how startups uh, like uh, Charge Trip. Um, use geospatial data to innovate uh, a certain vertical. So um, I'll just take you through our regular pitch and I hope it's interesting to, just to get a view of what a, what a startup does with geospatial data and why it's so important, especially for us. So um, I am uh, Gideon, CEO of Chartrip and Chartrip is quite a young company. Uh, we're based in Amsterdam, the Netherlands, but we've got people in Switzerland, Norway, uh, Spain, um, Romania and Austria. So we're uh, dispersed all over Europe. We've, um, we were founded four years ago um, and our background, my background specifically is in theoretical physics, but between all founders, our background is in energy. Um, we're just really interested in the renewable energy transition. Um, and we're very, um, we think electric vehicles uh, are very interesting catalyst in that transition. So essentially, Chart Trip mission, it's a very mission-driven company, is to get as many people as possible into electric vehicles. Um, and to do that, there's a couple of barriers to entry that we need to solve. Um, and Chart Trip positions itself as a SaaS, so software as a service-based uh, routing API that is very uh, competitive to companies like TomTom or here. So we do routing and navigation, essentially the mathematics and the physics to predict energy consumption for any type of EV and then plan a route accordingly, either for personal cars, or for entire fleets of electric vehicles. Um, so driving an electric vehicle and charging it on the road becomes very intuitive. So we take away all the guesswork that comes with electric driving. So I can probably share my screen and show you a little bit of a presentation with this. Um, yeah, so as I said, we're we're still pretty young. Uh, we do around a little bit old this presentation, but we do around two hundred thousand electric vehicle drivers a month, mainly in Europe. Um, we're now just launching in the U.S. We're around thirty people by now. Um, we're uh, venture backed. So our investors come from uh, Total, APX, Vindeg, and uh, typical like clean tech funds. Um, and we're, yeah, we're an EV routing platform. Uh, just because we think electric vehicles are the future, we want people to drive them and we wanna make sure you're comfortable driving them, whether you're a private driver or a fleet, it needs to become as predictable as normal ICE cars. And we use a lot of geospatial data actually to do that. So, What's the problem with electric mobility in the first place, right? Why is it a little bit different? Why are there different user experience paradigms than we're typically used to? Um, it's because it's very fragmented still. 
right? So it's a, it's a very new type of experience if you're driving and charging an electric car versus just your normal ICE vehicle. You need to deal with different plug types. You need to deal with uh, payment systems. You need to deal with uh, waiting at charge stations. Uh, but you also need to deal with all these outside impact variables that essentially determine the range of your battery at that specific moment, like the temperature or topography, uh, which is a, actually a very interesting uh, uh, geospatial uh, type of data that we use a lot and the accuracy of that data is extremely important. So um, I'm sure that most of you are very aware that electric vehicles are able to regenerate um, energy when either they roll downhill and there's an equilibrium between yeah, the uh, potential energy, the mechanical energy, uh, or when they break. Um, and topography data is very important because it gives us uh, a basis to predict how much energy a vehicle will be able to regenerate over um, a stretch of road. So we we calculate consumption based on segments that come from OSM, which is another uh, geospatial source. Um, and then we use uh, a lot of different types of elevation data sets to be able to calculate very accurate, and I'm talking about like um, uh, increments of five watts, so very accurate consumption based on all these outside imperfect uh, uh, impact variables like topography, but also like the weather, um, uh, like um, traffic data, um, a lot of real-time data sources uh, that we then use to uh, make like a, a map out of the consumption for a certain journey. And then we're able to predict where you need to charge and how long you need to charge for and how much the journey is going to cost you and whether you need to account for a certain regulatory, um, uh, regulatory impact on your drivers if you're paradigms is something that you'll be confronted with once you start driving or operating a fleet of electric vehicles. Um, so the, the main adoption barriers as we see them are range anxiety, charge anxiety, and the operational complexity of having this many electric vehicles or this many batteries on the road uh, that you need to make consumption predictions for, uh, for your dispatch algorithms or just so you can get comfortably from A to B. Um, and that's what we solve. So we do all the mathematical optimization and data sourcing um, to, uh, yeah, to solve these problems. And then we sell that back over um, yeah, a SaaS API to OEMs. So there's car manufacturers that use our navigation software in their vehicles, but there's also charge point operators that use our navigation software to build applications. Um, but there's also fleets and telematics companies that use our uh, routing uh, specifically for the dispatching or for like small electric fleets. There's not very big electric fleets yet, but uh, that's happening. So um, our mission is to make charging and driving predictable. We use a lot of different data sources to do that. Um, essentially, we're coming from a very road situational based way of doing navigation for vehicles where if you had to explain this like very, very basically, um, uh, if you have two ICE vehicles that travel from A to B, um, you would be very surprised if you got different routes and different ETAs back if you both plan using Google Maps or here or TomTom Tom or whatever, because anything that impacts that journey or the segments on that journey is based on road situational impact variables like traffic or incidents or stuff like that. Now, if you would do that same exercise, but you do it with two electric vehicles, then suddenly you'd be very surprised if two vehicles get the same route back. And that's such a like big shift in, in how we sort of think about routing and how we think about accessibility of getting from A to B is that these different types of vehicles and different types of batteries and different types of driving styles are suddenly very impactful uh, to your way of driving. So two different EVs from A to B would typically generate different types of routes because one battery might be slightly less charged or uh, the driving style of one driver might be very impactful on uh, the amount of energy you use or uh, that vehicle might have a different type of battery or different connectors or there's just so many more impact variables that you need to deal with. And then besides sort of the vehicle specific stuff, there's of course all the road situational stuff and uh, charging situational stuff uh, outside impact variables like the weather, temperature, road elevation, road service, curvature, all that kind of stuff that we typically get from, um, I'm guessing, companies that are attending this forum um, as data sources. So we don't actually generate a lot of geospatial data, although we do a little bit, but we use a ton of it. And we also try to improve that and mesh it and make sure that we uh, yeah, have really good um, road data and elevation data uh, all over the world, actually. 
Um, so then what you get is when you combine all of that and you are becoming really good at predicting consumption, it makes driving an EV or a fleet of EVs as predictable um, as it was uh, with an ICE car. And that's sort of our end goal is to make sure that we take all those barriers away. We make it super intuitive and super easy to get into an electric car and get from A to B and know exactly where you need to charge and how much it's going to cost you. Make sure you don't get end up in any queues at charging stations. Or when you have a fleet, make sure you pay very little for energy instead of a lot uh, because it differs a lot uh, um, in terms of what type of charge point operator use um, and that's all that data comes from geospatial data sources um, so it's very important to us and just to give you an idea about why the accuracy of it is so important is let's say like we're driving from here to switzerland um, i'd say like 30 or 40 percent of the energy that i'm going to use is actually uh, reiku energy or recuperated energy when i'm rolling downhill so especially if i you know, for big stretches of highway where there is a lot of elevation gain or, or, um, or where I'm going uh, downhill for quite a long time, I'm, uh, I'm able to recuperate a lot of energy. So the, the accuracy of that is, uh, is really important for our predictions. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having me. Any questions, uh, be happy to answer them. And uh, I'll be uh, listening intently to uh, the next presentations. Yes, definitely, Gijun. We feel, uh, we'll have a question answer session once we hear out Aditi. So we'll have all the panelists together to have a question answer session. So our next uh, panelist or speaker is Ms. Aditi Sinha, the co founder from Locale.ai. Aditi, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. It's great to meet you. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, uh, good night. I'm not, I'm not sure what are the time zones that you're from. Uh, but yeah, really glad to be talking here. And thank you so much, Geostation World, for inviting me. Uh, I'll just go ahead and present my screen. So just give me a moment. Uh, yes. Is it visible? Yeah. Awesome. So oops, yeah. So basically, you know, my presentation is going to uh, revolve around essentially what we do at Locale and what are the problems that we are solving uh, over here, right, in the geospatial world. So uh, first of all, a quick introduction of myself. Uh, as uh, as briefly talked about uh, from Sophia before, I'm Aditi. I'm one of the co-founders of Locale.ai. Uh, we started with this company around two and a half years back. Um, so again, uh, you know, pretty young, uh, but, uh, you know, right now we're growing pretty fast, uh, have companies from around uh, nine countries at the moment. Um, and we actually work with, uh, you know, uh, industries, not only in transportation, uh, you know, which includes your uh, electric scooters, scooter sharing, uh, bike scooter sharing, ride hailing, uh, but also, you know, now we are expanding into logistics and, logistics and supply chain as well. Uh, but before that, you know, what, what do we do and what is it that we're solving? So essentially, Locale is a location analytics platform uh, built for, you know, uh, operations and city teams to understand what's happening with their business on the ground. Very simply, right? Um, and the idea is, you know, how do we make operations and movement for all of those companies, uh, which have a very huge part of their business uh, where, you know, which operates in the real world, uh, much more efficient, right? And uh, which is why, you know, we started with uh, mobility and delivery and logistics as the first industries that we could target, right? Because they have a lot of assets and resources that are moving on the ground uh, that are constantly getting tracked. So, you know, after you actually track the data, the idea is, you know, how do we make sure they utilize efficiently? How do you make sure that, you know, uh, you're, you're able to increase their utilization as well? So, uh, the idea of locale is was very simple, right? Like today, for example, if you're a web-based company, uh, you would have a lot of web analytics tools that you use to, you know, not only get an understanding of what your users are doing on your websites or on your web apps, uh, but you know, you even run a lot of experiments. You send out, you know, very personalized promotions to your users. Uh, but you know, the question was, why doesn't a similar product exist for uh, your companies that have, you know, ground operations? Uh, can you just experiment and you know see okay what works in different areas what decisions and strategies is actually leading to an uh, you know uptake in the KPI that you want to improve uh, so that's the philosophy with which we started right like how do we enable uh, quick experimentation and iterations for your ground strategies and the idea was you know uh, one is of course you would increase the agility 
uh, because you would move fast, you would iterate on your experiments. Uh, and the other problem in the industry was that there were a lot of these BI tools that you know a lot of companies were using. Uh, but the problem with BI tools was that you know when it comes to handling large scale, high frequency geospatial data, right? These tools really uh, do not suffice for all the use cases. So, you know, the idea was how do we custom build a product specifically for these industries and for these use cases. And of course, all of that is happening without a single line of code for the end user. So we essentially take the data from the companies and do all the heavy lifting, uh, you know, on our side. And when we talk about decision making, right, we basically divide it into five steps. Uh, let's take an example, right? Like as a logistics company or as a mobility company, uh, one of the most important problems that you would have, what you would have to solve is uh, essentially, you know, increasing utilization of your access or of your resources. Uh, that could be your drivers, your scooters, your truck, trucks on the ground. So if you actually have to solve any problem, the first step that you need to have is, you know, creating the right set of matrix in place. Uh, once you create the right set of matrix, you then need to, you know, do your root cause analysis. You need to figure out why is the problem happening? When does it happen? Where does it happen? You know, is it, is it all the business verticals or is it just some business vertical? So you do all your root cause analysis then. Uh, and that is when on top of that, you can collaborate with different team members uh, because, you know, decision is never taken in a silo. There are multiple teams that come together and, you know, uh, be able to facilitate and implement their decision. And once that collaboration happens, then the actual implementing of the decision making uh, takes place and once the implementation is done that's where you go ahead and measure the impact of that decision uh, if utilization was the matrix that you were trying to optimize for did it actually increase or decrease after you took the decision so with locale you know all of these five steps that i've just talked about uh, the idea is you know how do we how do we make it so simple that if today for example it takes 60 to 75 days for a company to do all of this uh, and a combination of you know five different skill sets that are involved in all of these processes uh, the idea is, you know, how do we make it, you know, like a 10 click process uh, that comprises of everything just in one tool. Uh, I just want to talk a little bit about the use cases as well, very briefly, uh, because, you know, the theme of the conference is uh, specifically for logistics and supply chain. Uh, so some of the use cases that we have seen that, you know, companies use our product for uh, a lot of purposes is uh, one, is, one of which is, you know, SLA breaches, right? Uh, SLA breaches is a very important uh, use cases for them and they use the product to analyze, you know, what is the lap of the journey where SLAs are getting breached, uh, which client is it, right? Is it a particular SKU? Is it a particular warehouse or a DP? Uh, how much time does it take to deliver a ship shipment in different parts of the city? Uh, then, you know, uh, the idea is uh, in your last mile partic particularly, right, how, how many shipments are delivered per driver? Uh, what are the areas and what are the clusters in your city where, you know, you can definitely uh, improve the efficiency or the productivity of the driver, right? Can you do, like, for example, uh, one of the use cases that we were recently discussing with the company was that, you know, in, uh, in my city, there are some high priority zones and low priority zones. So for all the zones which are more high priority, you know, can we increase the SLA, but on, at the same time for the low priority zones, can we, you know, uh, increase the SLA by a lot, right? Because then uh, what would ensure is that, you know, the high priority zones would get a best, better customer service. Uh, the other use cases, you know, understanding all your delivery and the errors. So for example, understanding, you know, what are the areas or what are the routes where, you know, a lot of damages happen. Uh, what are the areas where partial deliveries are only happening or unsuccessful attempts? Uh, is there some pattern with packaging errors as well, right, with respect to a particular DP or a DC? Uh, yeah, and uh, with that, just, you know, I wanted to conclude with uh, one of the work that we, uh, one of the sample work that we did with, you know, a me Mexican-based logistics company. Uh, so the idea was that, you know, before Locale, uh, the problem was that their OTIFs, right, on-time and full deliveries was at an all-time low. Uh, they were basically, uh, you know, having a lot of manual processes that they were using to get insights, right? And, you know, with Locale, what happened was we not only helped them get visibility on what was happening, but on top of that, be able to do their own root cause analysis, understand, you know, what are the correlations with the problem with respect to different locations, different time, different SKUs, and so on and so forth. And as a result of that, you know, uh, we increased their OTF performance by 25%. Uh, if some, anyone is interested to check out this case study, it's already present on our website, so you can check it out. Um, okay, there was one uh, use case that was missed out. Uh, another use case which is very important is uh, across different clusters that you have in your city, uh, what, what is the cost of delivery that it takes you? 
right to reach that location and that basically changes based on the volume of the shipment that you're delivering or the different lanes that you're taking to basically reach that place um and finally uh, just to conclude uh, one of the themes was also you know what are the challenges that these companies are facing and in our experience uh, you know what we've come across is that there are three typical challenges that companies face uh in our experience what we've seen is that uh, with a lot of traditional logistics and courier companies uh to today they are not even tracking and collecting location data right and if they don't have location data in the first place uh you know they they don't have any visibility on you know where are things are at any given point of time uh even once they let's say collect uh, the data another problem that we've seen is the quality right uh the way the location data is collected or you know the way the data is stored right it's definitely not up to the mark in a lot of times you know our product is not built in a way uh that we can work with companies that don't have really good quality location data so we have to pass on a lot of logistics companies um and finally i think the another big challenge that we have seen is that a lot of companies are not really uh, you know very tech savvy in this space and there's a lot of education that we need to do in terms of you know uh, helping them understand uh, why should they need this why should they have this uh, tool you know what would what it would what how would it, it impact your operations and your typical kps that you're looking to improve uh, and again the conferences and workshops like this actually help you know reinforce that point so yeah but i think you know with the industry changing so much and so much awareness around us i think this is going to change uh, much as we go forward and uh, more frequently uh, but yeah as as i mentioned these are just some of the challenges that we have seen while working with some of these companies so yeah just to conclude i want to you know just say one line that we always tell the companies and people that we speak to that it's really really important to be data driven now you cannot be uh, intuition an intuition led company um and you can only improve something if you can measure it right you cannot improve something if you don't know today what is the how is it performing what is the measurement like today so that's that's uh, all about local and what we do um yeah if you have any questions i would love to take them up thank you so much thanks aditi and thanks to all the speakers for presenting their view uh, may i invite all the speakers to come on stage Mr. Gideon, as well as um, Mr. Justin, you can open your uh, cameras so that we can have a panel session. Even Aditi, if you can open your camera, we can have a panel session. I can't see Justin anyhow. Let's start with the question. We have few questions coming out from the participants, and some of the questions that I have for Gideon as well as Aditi. Uh, one question that came up from the participant was, uh, "What do you think would be the benefits and challenges associated with integration of frontier technology with geospatial data and technology?" So if we can start with Aditi. Sure. Um, I think that there's so many benefits, right? And uh, <laughs> technology itself is, you know, I believe uh, it's growing at such a rapid pace. So combining it with, you know, technology like AI, ML, IoT, everything that you mentioned, right? I believe this is going to be so many applications. So just to, you know, uh, give you some examples from the work uh, that we have done and the kind of, you know, use cases that we are seeing with the companies that we work with. Uh, so there's a lot of, you know, ideas around how do we give predictive alerts and insights based on, you know, whatever is the trend. So to give you an example, let's say a typical delivery company or a mobility company, right? uh if we tomorrow know for example that there's going to be a rain in a particular area in then in that city can we you know give them a predictive alert saying that uh, you know you have to provision more drivers in that area right for example or for example if you know that you know typically on a sunday evening uh, a lot of your bikes actually don't get picked up from this location uh, maybe you can be very proactive and let's say launch discounts right similarly with logistics companies they can be so proactive with the slas and the time that it takes to deliver so you know that you know when you uh, order something from an ecom uh, ecom company or a logistics company the exact time in, in which they will come to your doorstep is still not very clear right so a lot of these uh, you know technologies would only help i i guess to make all of these decisions much much more data driven make these companies become more proactive in their workflow and uh, yeah and as a result you know uh, improves their kpis 
Uh, Gideon, if you have anything to add on it over there. Coming to, uh, you know, another thing you talked about uh, integration in the workflow. So you have also shown some of the use cases, how this integration of geospatial in the workflow has been happening in the organizations that you have given solutions to. So I could understand that these are, uh, you know, integration for one particular solution. So how do you see that taking it to the enterprise level or implementing this entire system, the geospatial system at the enterprise level for the organization rather than just providing a solution? Um, so by enterprise level, you mean for the entire industry? Yes, if I'm not, entire not organization in the entire department, like integrating it with CRM, ERP and other, you know, departments. Right. So um, one of the things that we offer in our product, for example, is that, you know, you can connect it to different uh, workflow tools that you're using. Right. So, for example, if it's let's say, you know, you want to send uh, you want to have a very predictive uh, capability on the product and you want to action something on that. Right. The idea is, you know, just connect it with uh, your notification tools that you're using or your campaign sending tools that you're using. Right. And just on the basis of that, uh, it's not only useful for insight, but you can actually go ahead and implement the decision. Right. So in that way, you know, not only one team, so not only operations team in our in our particular case, but even marketing teams, for example, or growth teams, for example, can use, uh, you know, this technology and tools like that. So does that answer your question? Yes, of course, Sadhiti. Thanks a lot. Uh, Gideon, in your presentation, I could see that you are using geospatial data as a base data for, you know, mobility kind of applications. So what challenge do you face uh, while using the geospatial data? Are you facing any kind of challenge while, you know, availability or what any kind of challenge that you are facing when you are using the geospatial data? Sure. Um, I'd like to preface by fully saying that Aditi has much more relevant experience than I do. Um, but I think in general, I'd say the more granular and context aware you are of what is physically happening in the real world, the better your predictions are going to be and the more value they have, right? So we use a ton of geospatial data. Um, so I would say the challenges for us are granularity and accuracy, and they can be severely lacking, right? So a lot of, a lot of the geospatial data that we use, we're kind of stitching together ourselves um, out of many different data sets, DEM files. If we look at elevation data, I think we use like five or six different types of DEM files just to get sort of the, the coverage in specific regions that we need it to be. And then there is a lot of regions where it's just still not good enough, right? So for example, elevation data in tunnels in mountainous areas is really bad. Like elevation data on sort of the north side of mountains is really bad. Like with bad, I mean that sort of the granularity of it is, is not great. It's, it's less than what we would ideally use. Um, so, so yeah, I'd, I'd say the sort of the most challenging for us is to actually get that granularity uh, because it's just so important for um, for sort of our predictions, the predictions that we make. Um, I mean, if we go back to the to the last question, so you know, what is the state of adoption? I mean, we would we we use a lot of machine learning, um, so as a basis for the predictions that we make about energy use for vehicles, but also energy use at charge stations. Um, energy dispersions along networks. So one of the things that we also predict and that we also map is sort of um, how much energy is used um, within sort of the dispersion of city limits or um, municipality limits. Uh, so we're able to uh, sort of optimize the use of energy at stations, uh, um, all that kind of stuff we do with a lot of uh, um, AI and machine learning. And we also use some IoT sensors for that. Um, in general, I think like as a sort of more meta, as a civilization, uh, we're facing these massive, massive challenges at the moment. Um, and that sort of policy making is on the sort of the far end of, of trying to solve that. But there's a lot of companies that are able to use data driven machine learning theorems that can make massive impact without actually having to do much policy making. Um, and if that's something that we're pursuing, data transparency and data accuracy becomes even increasingly important. Um, so just a little bit of a sideline. 
Well, there's one interesting question that has come up uh, wherein a participant is asking, in order to maintain a huge number of data set from first mile to last mile, what kind of approach is taken by uh, you to safeguard these data sets in terms of privacy policy and regulatory framework? Aditi, do you want to go first? You're on mute. Sorry, I, I have no idea. Uh, thank you. Uh, so in our case, actually, uh, this this is a very you know uh, valid question for us because we sometimes work directly with competitors, right? So you can imagine that privacy and security both actually uh, becomes a very important uh, you know point for us to take care of. And uh, but your question was specifically around privacy. So for privacy, what we do is first of all we don't take any PII data, personal identifiable information. Uh, we're only dealing with IDs, lat long, and timestamps, right? So that is the first step in which, you know, we ensure that uh, there is no sensitive data that is coming to us. And most of the analysis and the insights that we do is in an aggregated format, right? So uh, we actually use, uh, not to go very technical, but we use uh, ag aggregations that are, you know, uh, provided a lot of open source uh, libraries from Uber to aggregate all of that lat long data at different granularities. Um, so that is the first thing. The second thing is, of course, uh, that, you know, we work with a lot of companies in Europe. Uh, in fact, actually, with Gideon, we, we work with companies from, uh, we work with companies from Netherlands as well. So we, we also GDPR compliant, right? And uh, we have to ensure that, you know, data is not getting out of Europe. So, you know, pro provisioning a lot of infrastructure uh, inside Europe for that use case, uh, that use case as well is something that we take care of. Uh, and, you know, of course, uh, Apart from that, you know, just following a lot of strict uh, security policies, so which includes encryption and, you know, making sure that uh, the data that is coming to us does not, you know, go anywhere. So all of the data that we get is in very isolated DBs inside the company as well. So, yeah, these are just some of the top, uh, you know, policies and practices that we follow to ensure both privacy and security. Yeah, and I, I think for us, it's it's pretty much the same. So we're we're a GDPR compliant company. So that's the General Data Protection Regulation from the European Union. Um, and then we do a lot of pseudo anonymization on data sets, and we also do a lot of data processing. So there's there's not much at the end uh, that you can actually lead back to something that's identifiable, and uh, the things that are identifiable are abstracted. Uh, to a sense that that they're you know you can never bring them back to a specific vehicle or a specific person um, so you know just simple gdpr compliance will get you a, a long way with these sets okay there's one question coming on understanding the you know economics behind the geospatial technology or geospatial data so it's about uh, asking uh, that how much percent is there towards geospatial technology spending in the supply chain and logistics sector today? That is how, how much is the spending by the organization from logistics and supply chain when it comes to geospatial technology? Any rough idea, like 10% of the entire IT, 1% of the IT, or they don't want to spend or there is not much spending? I mean, you know, um, I don't I don't really have any numbers around that. I can I can tell you how much we're spending on it and how mm -hmm. much our customers are spending on it. Um, yeah. But that, that would be that would be very little, to be honest. So a lot of the a lot of the geospatial data sets that we use are free, open source. Um, and a lot of sort of the output data that we do is processed by us. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't really spend any other resource on it than our, our own people. Um, typical customers like in the automotive and telematics space, I'd say it's like maybe five or, or, or 10 percent of sort of IT budgets that goes towards mapping and navigation uh, specifically. OK, so one last question to both of you. Uh, what needs to be done to increase or enhance the impact of applicability and adoption of geospatial technologies in this sector? Any thought, any idea? I mean, in general, I, I you know, I'm a, a really big um, um, 
um, promoter of uh, data transparency uh, when it comes to any type of geospatial data, because I think it's so crucial um, for us as a civilization to be able to solve these problems that we're running into. And I just think that um, uh, it's really nice as a startup to have access to that um, and to be able to use that to build uh, uh, specific propositions for the industry. Uh, so for me, data transparency is uh, crucially important. Um, and I'm, I'm, you know, that's not a tribe directed specifically at the GIS community because there is a lot of open source GIS data available and there's a lot of um, universities also investing in that. But when it comes to um, commercially generated geospatial data, it's, it's usually uh, extremely expensive and, and, you know, not within reach for a company our size. Um, and that's a shame because we can really use it to do uh, uh, quite incredible things. Aditi, your views on increasing or enhancing the applicability and impact? Sure. So uh, in my presentation, I talked about the three main challenges, right? So I'll just talk, uh, the, talk about the solution with respect to those challenges. So the first one, as I mentioned, was around uh, data collection itself. And I think Vivian also touched these on that. Um, I think if you look at the last five years, like geospatial data by companies, right, commercially, uh, it's, it's actually been collected at a very crazy rate. Uh, and I believe, and look at premise is that it's only going to increase, right? Um, but I think the cost that it takes to track and collect has to reduce, uh, you know, as we go forward. So, which basically means, you know, more innovation needs to happen uh, when it comes to enabling companies to, you know, uh, track uh, location data and, uh, you know, do GPS, uh, GPS sensing. So that is the first one. The second thing is around data quality. I think once once tracking is sorted, uh, you know, I think there needs to be a lot more industry standards and, uh, you know, uh, education around how do you, you know, improve the quality of the data as well. Right. Uh, of course, one part of it is like how the way you track it, but even if you're tracking it, the way you store it internally, right, is also a very big factor in terms of ensuring that the data is clean and it's corrected. So that I think will again just be improved as you know with more awareness, more education, uh, and finally tech savviness. I think this is something again it's slowly changing. Uh, I think uh, almost every company is now realizing the value of technology, data, especially after COVID. You know when we saw. A diffuse bump in the entire logistics and supply chain industry. So I only see, you know, uh, things changing for the better as we move forward. But these are the three top solutions that I could think of. Well, it was really interesting uh, to hear your views, both of you. And uh, it was, you know, for the understanding on the applicability as well as integration of this technology in the workflow, was the you know crux of the entire session that I would say. So thank you um, both of you for making this session a panel session an interactive one. And I would like to thank Justice Justin who could not like um, join us for the panel, but his presentation his thoughts were really interesting. And Gideon and Aditi, I would like to thank you for your presentation as well as the thoughts that you have shared during the panel session. So with this, I will end this session and we will rejoin again for our next session at, uh, you know, India time 730. So after 10 minutes from now, I would say, because I'm in India time zone, so I was reflecting to that time. But then, yes, we will uh, rejoin again for our next session on evolving role and business models in logistics and supply chain sector in next 10 minutes. So we'll take a break of 10 minutes.
Hello everyone. Welcome back. I extend a very warm welcome to the speakers of this session and participants across the globe to our virtual seminar on collaborative workshop for geospatial knowledge in the logistic and supply chain landscape. I, Dr. Shivangi Somwanshi, Director Geospatial Knowledge Infrastructure, Geospatial World, will be the moderator for this session on evolving roles and business models in logistic and supply chain sector. So considering the world scenario, the evolving user demands and the dynamic business environment demands a cognitive approach in the logistic and supply chain workflow through integration of frontier and geospatial technologies. And definitely this cognitive approach will be helpful in many ways like uh, promoting visibility, tracking and forecasting of products. Undoubtedly, the fourth industrial revolution and the dynamic business environment is contributing to the evolving roles of all the stakeholders in the value chain and the existing supply demand relationship should make way for new business and partnership models to leverage the uh, capability capabilities of all the stakeholders for collaborative knowledge creation. So keeping this in our mind, we have designed the second session of our seminar where our speakers are going to talk about the evolving roles and business models in logistic and supply chain sector. With this, I would like to introduce our first speaker of this session, Javier. Uh, as CEO of Cardo, Javier is uh, responsible uh, for driving the company growth and expansion to new and broader markets to achieve the company's mission, the democratization of local uh, location intelligence. So one of the pioneer of location intelligence, Javier founded uh, the company in 2012 with a vision to democratize data analysis and visualization. Under his leadership, Carto has grown from a groundbreaking idea into one of the fastest growing geospatial company in the world. So welcome, Javier. Floor is yours. Thank you very much. Hi, how are you? Um, good morning. Well, since this is global. Hi, everybody, whatever time zone you are today. Um, so just to check, can you guys see my screen? Yes. It is a okay, okay, fantastic. All right, so just gonna actually make it uh, full screen. So we have it in here. Okay, great. Right, so um, yeah, so thank you for the introduction. So my name is Javier de la Torre. I'm the founder of, uh, of Carto. Uh, today, I'm taking you know, like this, uh, uh, this session to talk a little bit about how we see some of the most disruptive trends that are happening right now in the industry and how we think this is going to have an impact in the logistics and supply Kind of like a uh, type of use cases when it comes to uh, space analytics. Uh, but before that, just uh, a little bit of an introduction towards, you know, what is Carto. Um, we like to call it an end-to-end -end location intelligence platform. So uh, since this is a very uh, sectorial uh, conference, I uh, need to explain you much, but overall, uh, we believe there's a huge opportunity when it comes to leveraging location data and spatial analytics in many different businesses process. And we want with our platform to enable um, all these new organizations that are new to location data to make, uh, to make the, most, the most out of it. So um, how do we do that? Is uh, essentially with uh, with one with one big platform we call uh, the Carto platform that is made of uh, multiple components. So we do have uh, one product that is more tailored towards data scientists called Carto Frames that allows uh, for the analysis and visualization of location data within Python notebooks in a more data science kind of like type of uh, uh, cases. Um, we do have an interface called Carto Builder, uh, which enables uh, non non experts to to design uh, analysis and you know, visualize data on the web, just drag and drop in. And finally, all of this is backed up by a set of APIs uh, that we made available for developers, uh, we, a set of you know like an SDKs, so you can develop your own applications. Um, because of our industry, and this is one of things we're going to be talking a lot. Um, uh, most of the usage. Users will need uh, third-party data to use together with their own data when it comes to spatial analysis. So we do have a, a data observatory, which is a collection of a lot of uh, different data repositories, and different uh, data sets uh, specialized for uh, spatial modeling. So uh, we use that. Actually, Carter is used for many different uh, um, industries, so from telecommunication, retail, citizen government, um, you know, like you name it. Obviously, a 
and like spatial analytics is very horizontal and logistics and supply chains is one of the one of the areas that we work in so i wanted to highlight just before that you know if you call like the use cases that we got on the industry for you to get a, a sense of how we what is our experience on this so we work, you know, with companies on the logistics side, you know, around um, you know, like optimizing the transportation network, right? So kind of like the space analytics that helps them, you know, to do the uh, the um, modeling, the preparations, the market analysis towards kind of like driving their their operations. Uh, within the same group, we also have a, a number of users of our own uh, um, routing engine that allows for uh, for um, you know for car last mile type of uh, delivery, and you know with heavy uh, type of optimization so that's also uh, some of our core use cases and very often and this is actually the most popular in this uh, sector on anything around car like market analysis territory management for car like uh, companies that are doing um uh, any form of you know deliver deliveries is a very common uh, uh use cases that you find there now um talking now more towards the industry to the point that you were saying like the logistic and supply chain industry is uh, is moving together with others, you know, towards uh, a big revolution that is powered by spatial data uh, and the cloud, right? So it's uh, we all call it said it, you know, like the, there's a huge world when it comes to you know to the cloud and you know and a huge number of companies moving and leveraging uh, and the cloud for their analysis. And this is changing a lot the way that we think about providing the service of uh, of spatial analytics on this sector. So. Um, in fact, actually, this is driving you know, like what we call a new set of requirements for spatial analysis that you know are going to have to be we're going to have to take in consideration. So we we're going to we never need more scalability. We have a lot of you know like cost effectiveness, accessibility, and data multiplicity. I'll just go through this. So this is some of the things that we hear from the industry as we go. So first thing is the scalability. I think that's very obvious to everybody that data is just growing faster and faster, and you know, like it's uh, and systems need to perform, you know, like now at a scale that you know, like it's just, it's just moving very, very, very quickly, right? So leveraging large computing capabilities has to be effective. It has to be transparent, right? It also has to be cost effective with this huge growth of data, um, you know, like the uh, the concept of you know, like having all data in memory, or you know, like uh, um, with these very um, expensive kind of like setups. You know, like they're idling for analysis. This is not really realistic anymore. Kind of like customers are looking for much more elastic, serverless type of experiences that you know provide a much more cost-effective approach towards you know like uh, this type of analysis, right? So this is something we hear a lot. Um, also, very important is the accessibility, especially at Carto, since you know like our motto is to democratize access to space analytics. Uh, we think, you know, geo and a lot of spatial analysis, especially also in logistics uh, optimizations, have to do, you know, like with, we, we do have to make them available to a wider audience. And that actually, for our from our point of view, it really means making them available on SQL, as you see. It's very, it sounds maybe just very direct, but the, the fact that now, you know, like a lot of spatial, a lot of, well, lot of analysis overall can be done through SQL, just on it, it opens the doors to a much wider audience of users that we haven't had before. And not only users, it also brings an incredible new level of interoperability with other products. So that's actually very, you know, like providing for SQL is a, is a huge request that we get all the time. And then the last thing is what we'll call uh, um, data multi-tenancy. And so if you think about like uh, the cloud, you know, like the uh, one of the biggest promise that it provides is these vision that you we all live in a single database in a way that you know like if i share data between a provider and a consumer you know for their analysis they don't have to download they don't have to transform it it's all just kind of like if it was already on their on your database and that's actually one of the things that you know like the the cloud is providing i i like to call i put it in this way in a sql uh statement because obviously this is one thing that we thought but you know the, this concept of like now Users of um, of, uh, of uh, spatial data expect their data to be just a join away. What I mean with a join away is that you know they are on their database and they need you know like these different pro uh, data sets to be always updated, always you know like in uh, um, like you know like ready um, without having to do any transformations around them. So this concept of you know, like on the cloud that you can have your database and it gets augmented by data providers and it all happens seamlessly, I think from my point of view, it's going to be the most disruptive part 
you know, when it comes to uh, um, to the uh, uh, um, to the, the way the data is distributed uh, on the industry. Now, that brings us, you know, actually to the to the point. One of the things that you know I think is going to affect this uh, uh, this industry is what I call this cloud wars on the data warehouse. So um, there is a huge, you know, like uh, towards you know, like this building in this vision of like you know, like uh, the the data warehouse will be able to unite multiple sources from multiple places that now you have um, you know, like multiple cloud vendors providing an offering that allows you to kind of like integrate sources you know like in a very seamless way and this is one of the things that you know customers love the most right so if I can give you, you know, like traffic data and that traffic data is on your database to join away and you never have to worry about uh, updating it it's always updated and you have to take care about you know like um, you know how do you make use of it so that's that's gonna be uh, that, that's a fundamental kind of like value proposition that these cloud vendors are are pushing for. So, um, so actually, we we are like riding onto that into that way. We call it you know like going cloud native. This is opening a ton of opportunities for our industry. So, for example, in our case, Carter Data Observatory, as I was mentioning, is repository of uh, spatial data. It's now has like more than nine thousand data sets and growing. We make it all available directly within those data warehouses and that's a huge strength again you know like moving from the from the times when you're like for doing any analysis you will download data and then you will run it on your systems to essentially kind of like having that data loaded into your systems by the provider that's going to be a huge huge change and we're doing that already with a, a, a large set of uh, data sets around financial human mobility road traffic all of that, you know, I like just again making it uh, making it available inside uh, those data warehouses. I think it's going to be huge in that in that perspective, um, right? Uh, so that's that's one part, right? Um, you, you you need to have the data, and you need to actually be able to use that data within those systems. And for that, I want to give you actually uh, I want to show you one demo that I think is very eye opening in the way that we think about like analytics on this space. Obviously, it's going to kind of like go through this a little bit faster. And the deployment of high performance infrastructure, you know, like that's something that we 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 see a lot now. Uh, but I think you know, like we we published recently this blog post, and actually on our logistics uh, uh, um, kind of like section of of the blog, around something that we've been working now for a, a number of uh, a number of months, or, you know, years, um, which is this concept of doing routing within. Um, SQL in your data warehouse directly, right? So we publish it in here. There's a um, you, you actually go to the uh, to a blog post. You can read about it. It's very can be quite technical in the way that it's done. But if you think about it, I mean, like the fact that you know, like you can do routing on 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 SQL that exists uh, for some time. But the fact that you can do and affect the routing based on traffic data that another provider is giving you directly through the data warehouse and it's always updated and you can use it from any tool that supports SQL, that's a level of interoperability, integration, accessibility, scalability that I think we've never seen on this on this industry. I think that's actually how we're going to, in a way, you know, like push down spatial analytics and our kind of like concept of, um, of um, location intelligence to, to the masses, you know, like always updated, scalable and accessible, and finally cost effective. So, um, so I, I invite you to call, like, uh, read about it, you know, like, and, and take a look at, you know, like how we, how we design some of these routes and how we can change the weights and, you know, like to dynamically or purely based on SQL and on data that is integrated. I think, you know, like that's, that's, that's a great case of this kind of like cloud um, uh, computing um, or you know, say cloud geospatial infrastructure that is coming. I think to to an end, and I just want to call it wrap it up uh, 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 with that. You know, like it's uh, um, going to call like uh, skip through some of these. I think this is going to really liberate the long term vision that we've had in our industry around spatial data infrastructures. I think you know, like finally the cloud had in has enabled really this view at a scale and you know and, in, and with the the right economics to actually really now flourish i think that's going to have a huge impact on on this industry so i think that's about it uh thank you very much thank you thank you javier for such a stimulating discussion on how the cloud native is changing everything uh, i would request you to stay back 
uh, we'll be having a panel discussion after the presentation of our next uh, presenter. So it's time to introduce our second speaker of the session, um, Katie Paklin, head of uh, customer experience PostNard. Well, um, for the past decade, Katie has had the opportunity to get a close view of the logistics industry's entire sales life cycle, starting from telesales to heading the entire sales department and customer service. So during the past three years, Katie has been working closely with the cross-border e-commerce customer and partner networks to ensure a positive customer experience. So in addition, Katie is also responsible of the CX strategy locally in Finland. So, hey, Katie, over to you. You're on mute, Katie. All right, technical difficulties. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes, very much. All right, thank you for the introduction and thank you for having me. Uh, I will be speaking from a little bit of different point of view than Javier. Let me share my presentation. Uh, let's let's get that um, there. Yep. You see it now? Yes, it is visible. Okay. Very good. Oh. Uh, Perfect. Yep. And uh, yeah, before before I go and start, uh, as as uh, was uh, sorry, I, I have to um, do one thing. Are you still with me? Can, can you yep. still see the presentation? Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, as I said, I think it is on a presenter's view. If you can. Change it on a slide show mode. Yes. Are we on it now? Yes, yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I will be speaking uh, about the um, technology and, and, and the need for it from the customer experience point of view. So it's a little bit different than, than the technical side, which, of course, it's a huge part of it as well. But let's get starting. So as we all know, we are in the uh, heart of fourth industrial revolution, and this is happening at an increasing speed as we speak. Um, even 10 years ago, when I started in logistics, uh, we were still doing lots and lots of manual work, including like uh, writing down uh, shipping uh, instructions to the parcel and attaching them to them. Everything is now being digitalized. Um, also on the business side, the e-commerce is growing at a fast pace, uh, not the least driven by the COVID pandemic and the customer demands are changing faster than ever. So with this rapid change, uh, logistics networks have to become more and more transparent and consumers are expecting everything to be effortless and easy. Um, this means not only well-planned end-to-end processes and partnerships, uh, but also the ability to react in real time when something goes wrong. So while we utilize modern smart technology, uh, artificial intelligence, IoT, uh, in our development, at the same time, we have to build uh, the systems to be agile and have the ability uh, to adapt to the human mind. And with human mind, I'm referring to the customer's wants and needs and their behavior. Uh, all this development over the years has made it possible that, you know, before you have to take the car to the, the, the closest mall and, and go through like several stores to find what you needed, everything in the whole world, the services, the products are literally uh, behind one screen with the push, push of a button. Um, so for us logistics providers, this means that in order to fulfill the customer expectations, the whole delivery process has to be very carefully planned. Uh, from the warehouse through multiple terminals, uh, all the way to, in our case, in Finland, after which the customer will receive notifications to your phone 
with further instructions on where to pick up the parcel, where is it going to, which locker code is it, or when will it be at your own home. Uh, of course, to support all of this, you need technology and you need um, different location data uh, analysis as stated in the previous presentation. And then at the worst case scenario, you still have to reverse the process if the customer wants to return something and everything has to work as smoothly as it did in the beginning. So the, once the customer has clicked on the last button in the checkout and approved the order, uh, there's like complicated chain of events uh, which is triggered. Uh, and that chain of events is full of dependencies. Uh, and this is the part where the technology and human in close operation make sure that whatever is promised to the customers, that will also happen. Now, we measure success uh, or success is often defined uh, based on hard measurements uh, such as revenue or efficiency, uh, lead time, technical quality, etc. And uh, you know, it, it, it the success in those depends on all, you know how well we define the processes related to them and 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 uh, you know follow through them. So without the constant automation of processes and, and decreasing the amount of manual labor, logistic companies simply will not be able to compete in this market. That is very clear. Um, yeah, I'm sure all of us in income delivery business in general know that these things, so that's really no news there. But let me ask you this question. What happens when the laws of physics come into play? When we can't deliver any faster than competi competitors or when we can't, uh, um, you know, deliver any more cost efficiently? Uh, what happens when we have streamlined all of our processes, networks and tools to the point where it's just not possible to improve. So how do we as a business uh, beat the competition then? So, well, in the middle of this fourth industrial revolution where tons of resources is aimed toward the technical improvements, digitalization and AI, uh, the answer is quite actually simple. We need to win the hearts and minds of the customers. Or, or, or even the people, not only the customers. And even better, if you are able to turn your customers and your employees uh, to your fans, you're onto something. Then you have a reason to invest in technology. Then you have the money to invest in technology. And then you have a business to, you know, run, which is the goal. So don't take my word for it. Uh, there's a lot of research to back this up. Uh, based on Harvard Business Review, uh, according to inspired employees, if you're able to inspire your employees, they're up to 250% more productive than the dissatisfied ones. So if that's not one reason to invest on your people and start the process and start the, the um, um, development from the people, I don't know what is. And then at the same time, if you look at the customer experience, 50% of the customer experience formation is based on a feeling. So not your product, not your service, how well you did, but the feeling that the customer uh, got when they used your product or service. And again, when you take that further, happy customers become loyal customers. And the loyal when, you, when you're able to, to build that loyal customer base, uh, according to research, uh, you will get up to 85% advantage in the sales growth compared to your competition. And, and that's quite impressive figure as well. So in, in order to start driving the development from the customer point of view, and I'm, I'm talking about the technology, uh, uh, technological development, um, you need to know not only what they think, but also how they behave. In other words, listen and observe. Somebody said that, okay, better yet, if you really want to know what your customers want, don't ask. Wait, <laughs> now what does that mean? Well, I'll tell you what it means. 90% um, of decisions, consumer decisions, when I decide to do that, 90% of those are made subconsciously. So this means that in the future, we may not be asking the customers what they want or you know what directions to develop our services, um, but instead studying them. 
So instead of uh, if if we instead of asking observe them, look how they behave, you know, we need to understand their behavior and uh, how they use product and services and how they fit into their daily lives, and and then we get in touch with their rational. Um, uh, uh, rather than the rational brain, we get into the subconscious mind, which made those decisions. Um, yeah, that could also mean that the collection of feedback would not be needed anymore. Instead, it would be only observing um, the customers. So we're actually doing both when we develop our services. We're collecting the feedback, we're asking the customers how they felt about the delivery, but we're also observing them. And, and, and we're observing their uh, buying habits, we're observing their, um, you, know, you know, where are the people going to live. We use a lot of uh, locational analysis to, to, to build our services, uh, you know, in a way that we're fulfilling the customer expectations, their needs and wants. Um, and in order for us to do that, we need the support of AI and uh, technology to really get to the um, get to the bottom of it, where we should go. Now, if you haven't done that, or if you haven't, uh, if if you're not sure yet, you know how how the customer within your organization is directing the processes and development. Uh, I suggest you might start from here. Uh, conduct a survey. Uh, where you will find out the current status of your customer experience management maturity. And this model, uh, this survey will tell you, you know, where to go, where you are right now and how far you should go or what direction you should take. Now, in the end, what matters? How do we keep up competing and building up a successful business? And how do we use all this technology uh, to do that? Now, Customer expectations are very simple. Uh, at the moment, we're looking into e-commerce. We want to buy more online. When we buy more online, we expect things to happen. We don't care if it's coming from another side of the world. We just want it to be easy and effortless to us. So regardless of the fact that the parcel is going in and out the trucks, in and out the ferries, getting closer to your home, there might be um, uh, a message to you saying that, you know, pick a time slot, I pick a time slot, the parcel starts approaching to you, there's traffic, you need to know, okay, it'll be delayed, it not, it's not going to be delivered today, and uh, then what happens after that, I need to reschedule delivery or direct it to another service point. All this needs technology to support it uh, for us to, to be able to successfully uh, fulfill the customer needs or, or expectations. So technology is a huge part of our success, but who really decides it? If we're part of the evolution of, of uh, the, the next thing, you know, what, the, the, the next revolution, um, this is the guy who's in the middle of it. Us businesses exist because he decides so. As, as long as he's buying, pressing that button, we all have a business. When he decides to do something else, then we have to think of something else. So you might have heard this quote before, that you get to start with the customer experience and work toward the technology and not the other way around. And that is why customers is um, very important. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katie, for such an interesting insight on the uh, need of technology from customer's point of view. Thank you. Uh, may I request both the speakers to come on the floor, uh, like if you can turn on your camera so that we can start off with the panel discussion. Hi. So there are many, there are lots of questions that are coming from the audience. So let us take up a few of them. Uh, we'll start from Javier. Um, there's one question, how big is the supply chain and logistics sector within the location intelligence market, according to you? And how has the awareness towards the building location enabled platform for real time tracking changed the post pandemic? Yeah, oh, on the first question, it might be actually better to ask you. <laughs> right? You guys are the experts on market analysis on this. Uh, so it's, it's hard for me to say uh, 
I think the last time I read it was on the order of like 30, 35 percent or 40 percent. So it's actually uh, it's actually quite significant. Uh, and since obviously uh, logistics and well, supply chain, but you know, like logistics, for example, it's uh, uh, geospace has a, a huge uh, economic impact on you know when it comes to logistics. So, so I think you know like that's one of the reasons. But I, I'm not the best to actually talk about the overall market. You guys are better than I. And what, what's your opinion? How big it is? I think it is very less, specifically in this sector. Yeah, in this sector. Okay. All right. Well, there you go. So, <laughs> okay. Okay. Fine. So how was the so the second one? Now that one I could talk a little bit more around this. So uh, how was the awareness towards building location enabled platforms for real time tracking? Same post pandemic. I don't think there is necessarily so much, you know, like of a change that I've seen, you know, because of pandemic in this, but but an acceleration, right? So the uh, pandemic has essentially accelerated a lot of uh, a lot of the projects, at least that we've seen, you know, from customers. You know, like most of them either it's kind of like investing even faster towards, you know, like changing um, their delivery methods or you know, like other or their uh, customer experience online and how it connects to you know, like providing the services. That's something that just got accelerated. And anybody that was actually kind of like looking at optimizing or you know, like using. Um, Spatial analytics to kind of like um, you know like optimize some of these process. I think that that just has to kind of like advance their their um, uh, the roadmap. And in that concept, you know, like I don't. There's only very few organizations that are doing like real time, real real time kind of like uh, logistics uh, optimizations or you know like or, or changing the supply chain in a very real time manner. It's only a few of them that can afford it. But definitely, you know, like things are getting stretching. You know, like from going towards you know like months of preparation towards your like much, much more, you're like closer to real time. So it's, I think it's all part of the acceleration. Thank you so much. Uh, one very interesting question for both of you. Um, how, according to you, business models have evolved over the years with the increasing penetration of uh, geospatial and frontier technologies? Uh, I can start with Katie. I mean, I, I can I can answer from the customer point of view uh, regarding the the business models. As I said in a presentation, that I think the driving factor companies are starting the businesses are starting to realize that you know, in air in a areas such as logistics, which is uh, traditionally very heavily production driven businesses, and it, it's it, traditionally it's been like you know streamlining the operations, which is better for us internally, which is easier for us to handle the parcels and things like that. And now the model has kind of swift around that, you know, it's the customer who's in the driving seat. And that's not always the easiest, you know, thing for us to 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 kind of like manage or or that's not the easiest change for us to not not the cheapest by far <laughs> to do. So so the in, in the core of the business, it has been realized that, you know, un, unless we are agile and we make those decisions for example uh, open-ended IT systems where it's easy you know easy to attach and, and move something uh, to to fulfill the customer needs to be able to move with the customer um, you know we're, we're not going to make it in business so I think the biggest change has been from you know the very inside out type of uh, um, uh, point of view in, in the logistics to, to kind of like outside in and how, how how can we keep up with the chains and how can we be what the customers are expecting us to be. Mm -hmm. yeah. Your perspective. Yeah. No, I totally agree from the from the customer perspective. I think that's very clear. I mean, I think so, you know, like same day delivery. I mean, like it's I mean, there's all this kind of like new. I mean, commerce. I mean, like I would say like businesses and you know like and processes that we didn't think it was even possible before. And they're now only possible because of the technologies that is powering them, right? And so I think you know, there's a, obviously a, a, a huge impact in that, you know, like technology allocation data in that sense has actually got like enabled. So so you can see very well on your on your customer experience every day. On a, on the kind of like on the on the industry and the more enterprise cases, the level of optimizations is always you know, like harder to see because it kind of like gets normally very internal towards each organization. Um, but I think you know, like it's uh, uh, and my my perspective is like uh, um, you know, like based on the demand that we see from those type of like use cases. Um, I think now we are at that tipping point where you know, like before was kind of like a, it was sort of like a nice to have or something you know that was very kind of like just like 
in the innovation side towards now, where I would say most enterprise organizations consider it a fundamental part. So if you're not looking at optimizing your process, if you're not doing analysis to kind of like work in an, in an optimal way, you're going to be behind in, with, your, with your competitors and you know, your business model is going to lag and your customer experience are not going to be as, be, as good. So it's, it's just, I think that's actually probably you know, like the, the, how it has evolved in that sense. That is no longer about like um, some research project, but rather about like how we actually we make it part of our operation. Yeah, and, and to add to that, on the commercial side, there has been a huge uh, shift in, in a way when you look at the e-com stores is that uh, they used to have only one service provider. So, so you, you know, you, you could just, if you order from the store, you didn't have the you know choice to, to kind of compete again between the logistics companies. Now, based on all the research, the consumers are driving the change where they want the choice. So they don't want the store to choose for you which logistics provider or which service they want to use, but they want to 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 be the one who's choosing the things, which is also pushing for the, you know, the, the agile transformation that we need to to um, keep up with. The, the other vector, I don't know um, what you think, Katie, but you know what we've seen is everything around you know, electrification and you know the, the decarbonization of the industry, right? That's a huge driver. But essentially, it's also looking at optimization and where technology has a huge path yeah. on that one. So I think you know, like that's the other kind of like um, influence that has accelerated the entire industry in that sense. So I think that we see that a lot too. Yeah. Okay, and uh, one last question for Katie here. Um, how have you uh, your requirements of map content evolved in the last two to three years? I'm sorry, how has my requirements of requirements of map content uh, provided through map APIs? Uh, it, it has changed because the customers, if, if you look at the services of, of again, Ecom products, basically there are two different uh, services. There's home deliveries and then there's um, uh, pickup points and, and um, um, service point deliveries. And then when you look at the customer experience that, you know, People in Finland, especially, they want um, and this little bit of background to my answer. <laughs> People in in Finland, they want particularly they want parcel lockers. Now, the challenge with the customer experience comes uh, when the parcel locker is full. the The single largest negative impact to the uh, uh, customer experience is when you don't get the parcel where you want it to. And the, the parcel lockers are very tough to uh, uh, scale. So it's 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 like a physical module and it has like an X amount and there's a lot of different logistics providers that are using those parcel lockers. So a concrete example is like when we brought in our um, network, our, our uh, pickup point network, for example, the parcel lockers, we need to use the, the data uh, to know, you know, where where do we have the most dense areas? Uh, where where do the people live? Where where is the most redirections going? And then we're using all that data to expand uh, our um, pickup point network to the right locations. And again, in the big uh, in the background, there's the customer experience. We want our you know customers to choose us, and we want them to be able to um, get the parcel in the location they want to. But in order for us to develop the network, we need all that data. So that's what like one concrete um, example of the way we use. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so there are actually numerous questions which are coming up to my mind, but uh, as you know that there are short of time, so probably we can take up these questions to have further discussions offline or maybe in some other occasion. So with this, we came to the end of this session. Thank you so much, have you and Katie, to, uh, for joining us today. We had a really interesting session um, uh, which uh, actually brought out an understanding of the evolving roles and the business models in this, in this specific sector, logistic and supply chain. So with this, we are moving ahead to the third and the final session of this seminar, where we are going to have an exclusive talk on partnership and collaborations in logistic and supply chain sector. And the session will be taken ahead by John Kedar, strategic advisor, geospatial infrastructure, geospatial world. So John, the floor is yours now. Great. Well, thank you very much to the last um, speakers. That was really, really interesting. Um, and I was very taken indeed, actually, by um, some of Katie's points, um, the, the human points, um, because 
I think that's perhaps better. Um, I hope you may have missed what I said, so I'll just say again, thank you much to the last speakers. Um, very interesting, and I was very taken by the human points that Katie brought up, um, because um, as, as Javier um, also has made the point, you know, understanding our users, understanding our consumers is so important um, in delivering um, the, the, the business solutions um, that, that are going to work for them. And I think it's something the geospatial community that I've been involved in um, has got right at times and wrong at times. Um, sometimes we've always said, well, we know best. And we think we know best without having actually asked or indeed studied um, what is going to happen um, next in the world or in a particular sector, hence today's conversation. Um, but really interesting. And, and I think our final um, panelist, if you like, our final speaker um, for the day will be equally um, interesting. As you can see um, from your programs, it's um, Siva Ravada, Vice President of Development and Oracle. Um, and, and it's something that perhaps many of you know, but many of you won't. Um, uh, Siva has spent uh, 24 years at Oracle, um, so he probably knows what Oracle does um, through and through. Um, and I hope that will give us a great insight as he talks to us now um, and provokes some questions um, to Siva. Um, we're not going to take the full one hour for this session, um, everyone. Um, not unless you've got thousands of questions. Um, we'll come to a halt um, at uh, an appropriate time. Um, so, um, Siva, I hand the floor to you. Oh, okay, thanks, John. So I'm the only speaker for the session then? You absolutely are. You t take okay. your time, give your presentation, then we'll take questions, and I've got some for you as well, and we'll have a discussion, okay. um, and, then, um, and then we'll draw everything to a close. Okay. Um, I think we've had apologies at the last minute, actually, from from um, um, Sina Kashuk from Foursquare. I think that was a, a this morning um, dropout. So, uh, the floor uh, is yours. So, can you see my screen or no? Uh, yes, we can see. Oh, we did. We had your screen for a second. Okay. Okay. Now you can see it. Right? Yeah, we can see it now. Yeah. Okay. So I'll go back to the presentation mode. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to take the whole hour, so maybe I'll talk about 10 minutes and then uh, we can go to some questions. So as uh, John mentioned, uh, I'm from Oracle. So I'm mainly responsible for the spatial related technology development at Oracle. But um, uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about a broader sense of uh, what is happening in the whole um, logistics and supply chain sector. And then how do we want to look at the spatial and location based technology in, in this whole scope. So if you look at the session topics that are suggested, so the current state of collaboration, current and future areas of collaboration, and those kind of things. My, my, my main background is the technology. So I'm going to focus more on um, what is the current state of technology in the supply chain uh, management applications and what needs to change to make it uh, adapt to the current state of uh, requirements. Uh, the last question there is what needs to change to improve the geospatial knowledge collaboration. But I think this is a little bit, uh, we are not there yet. So right now, if you look at the whole supply chain technology and the whole set of applications people use, the basic knowledge collaboration itself is a problem. Forget about geospatial knowledge collaboration. A lot of them are not even there at the basic knowledge collaboration stage. So, so that's the first problem that they need to solve. And then the geospatial knowledge collaboration will follow. And also, since this is a, almost like a redesign of a lot of these basic technologies, they, a lot of them shouldn't even be looking at geospatial as a separate thing. So they, they should be looking at geospatial as basic part of the whole uh, knowledge that they have to manage. So if they start thinking about geospatial as a separate technology on top of what their domain knowledge is, then it's not going to have a very neat integration that can really leverage a lot of the geospatial uh, advances that we have. Uh, so if you look at the last couple of uh, a few decades, a lot of the time there is new technology comes in and then that uh, massively disrupts what is happening in the whole industry. 
so if you look at the logistics industry, a lot of people have talked about today, there is a lot of spatial integration in the logistics industry, especially at the B2C, at the customer end, end of it. So today, for example, if Amazon is delivering you a package, it can tell you that I am 10 minutes away from delivering it to you. But a lot of those things haven't really gone to the B2B level. If you look at the supply chain management, there are a lot of B2B segments before it comes to the B, before it comes to the end user consumer. So a lot of these things haven't uh, gone all the way back into the B2B segment of the whole um, uh, supply chain. And then expectation, uh, expectations are changing. Um, again, Amazon and some of these delivery companies made it so that uh, as the end user, you are now expecting real time tracking of everything that you are buying. Right. So again, a lot of this happens in B2C, but not really in B2B space. So this uh, slide is a little bit busy, but the main thing I want to uh, focus is uh, again, Katie also mentioned this customer experience is the number one thing today. So people want to have a very good experience when they buy a product and from the minute the order till the time the product is delivered to you, they want to have the best customer experience. Uh, and then some of, a lot of these uh, surveys, they show that people are actually willing to pay more for better customer experience. And then some of the 75% of online customers, they if, they if they're buying something online, then you want to be notified of everything that is happening uh, as soon as possible, right? And then also this is thing that customers, some of the customers are even willing to switch to a service, different service, if they can get a better experience. So, so if you're redesigning or redoing a lot of these things, you have to keep in mind what Steve Jobs said, right? It starts with the customer and then work backwards to figure out how do you build the whole system to satisfy that um, expectation. So if you're sticking with the traditional systems, then it's really kind of hard to uh, deal with all of these uh, new technological challenges, complexity and all of this uh, that comes with these traditional systems. So, so modern systems and the things that are being developed today uh, from the ground up, they enable the innovative, proactive and continuously improving supply chain practices. So if you look at a modern supply chain, there are a lot of different pieces in this. So first and foremost, it has to be built on a unified open architecture because there are a lot of different partners and a lot of different um, technological pieces involved in building a supply chain. If everything is a closed system, then it becomes really hard to do an integration. So from the ground up, it has to be built on a unified open architecture so that the data can be exchanged and the knowledge can be shared. And then if it is built on an open architecture, then it becomes very easy to access the data, not just for individual pieces, but if different segments in the pipeline want to share and access the data, then it makes it easy to do that. And then uh, security is also very important because just because it's an open architecture doesn't mean that people who don't have the privileges can access the data, right? So it has to be secure and then contained so that only people who have the right privileges can look at the data. And then all of these things, uh, cloud is the biggest driver for building such a system. So if you look at any of these modern technologies, they're all going to be built on a solid cloud-based platform. So Javier also mentioned about cloud-based platforms. So if you go with the cloud-based platform, you will you can take advantage of a lot of these modern location-based services that are available in all of these cloud-based platforms. And it also gives you access to high-end technology like machine learning and AI, which is not easy to build if you're starting from ground up. So the one thing I left out of all of this thing is the location intelligence. The reason is when you think about location intelligence, we don't want to think of it as a separate entity. We want to make all the people understand and be able to use this location intelligence. So people start thinking about it as separate. Mm 
the the getting location at the end stages of the plan is not really going to change anything so it has to come from the bottom up so that information is used in every part of the process so so that's the main thing is going from inside to action so first thing is build it on a open look open cloud based platform so that when you have all of these different pieces all of them can talk to each other in instead of being them as a separate uh, closed systems by themselves they all work on the same unified open interface based cloud system and then they can talk to each other and then that makes it very easy to share the knowledge and then also propagate the information from one stage to the next stage and then that makes it very easy to response respond to some event so when some event happens so today if they are closed systems every part is by themselves then and some event happens they can react to it but they, there is no easy way for them to propagate that information to other parts of the supply chain system so with this kind of uh, uh, the last part is uh, once you have once you build these kind of things on a open platform then uh, the visibility will increase so when an event happens that is going to impact other parts in the pipeline then everybody can have the visibility to that uh, part uh, to that event and then accordingly if it is built with some machine learning algorithms everything can be automatically adjusted so that uh, the new execution plan or new um, or routing plan all those things will happen automatically or at least in the minimum everybody has the visibility to some event that everybody knows that something has to change so so that's the overall goal is to be able to build these kind of thing, things on an open cloud based platform and then think about location as a fundamental aspect of all of these different stages of the supply chain not just as a afterthought and then that will make it really useful so that people can really share that knowledge and then use uh, these cloud based technologies that are that provide uh, location based services and then that provide machine learning and uh, ai and uh, all those kind of advanced technologies so that everything can be integrated with these modern technologies and then be able to dynamically make changes when the, when the events happen so i'm going to stop there Siva, thank you very much would you just mind um we we had a bit of trouble um at one stage of your presentation i think it was about slide nine when you were talking about geospatial you you um would you mind just repeating going back to slide nine and repeating i think it was slide nine go back one more no go back one more probably this one right this one yeah we we had um we we, oh, we dropped okay. you at that point and if you could just re-explain that one i think that might be useful to the audience thank you okay yeah so when i look at a lot of these um different um, things that people look for in supply chain management applications a lot of times people talk about the things that I have in the light uh, color. So they talk about um, integrated systems, demand driven. It has to be agile so that everything can um, adapt to the change very quickly. Uh, user experience is also very high priority. And then usually they put the location intelligence and the our geospatial as a separate box. From what from my experience, what I see is if you think of this lo location knowledge as a separate box then it doesn't really do an integration with all of these things at, at the from the bottom side of it so what i mean is if you want to look at um, user experience right not just putting stuff on the map so that's a good thing to show stuff on the map but to, when an event happens if you are able to take advantage of that and then use that um, location event in your own machine learning algorithms so that the pipelines are now automatically adjusted so that is the kind of uh, location based knowledge sharing that has to happen 
So how we are already talked about some of these things, right? So we want to be able to take the location information at every stage of this uh, supply chain management pipeline and then use that information for driving your algorithms, for driving your machine learning algorithms, or driving for driving your uh, uh, routes and everything else. So everything that you do, if there is a location-based event, then use that information to make the decision. Not just say that I made the decision, but the event happened, so now what do we do, right? So uh, that's where I'm coming from. Okay, now th thank you for, uh, sorry to ask you to repeat that, but it was, I think it was yeah, um, no really, really important point to get across. Now we've got a couple of questions from the audience, which I'll pick up on first. Um, and the first one I've got is from Pulkit Chowdhury. Um, and he asks you, uh, what are the major reasons for tech innovation bias towards real time tracking, um, or not bias, but emphasis in B2C? rather than b2b um is, is there a particular reason why we've got the b2c much better than the rest of it yeah so b2c we got much better mainly because when the customers are driving that right so because we are the end users and we are the if you look at the whole marketplace the number of customers is much bigger than if you look at the b2b segment of it and then we are the ones where actually uh, being spoiled by some of these things that companies like Amazon and other companies do that give customers a much better experience. Now that Amazon is giving a much better experience, now we expect the same kind of things from other goods and services that we buy. But that kind of thing hasn't happened in B2B mainly because, again, everybody has their own problems to deal with in B2B. So for them, this hasn't gone through yet. Okay, no, th thank you very much. And and I can see your point here about open architecture and so on, um, and, and perhaps open standards being absolutely critical to, to enabling some of that B2B work to progress. Um, another two questions, which I'll just pick up on, um, if I may, um, and I'm reading them directly. So let's take the next one. What are the major factors that are influencing business intelligence companies towards building location analytics capabilities? Um, are these capabilities being developed in-house or are they being developed through partnerships with location analytics companies? Yeah, so um, that actually depends on which company you talk to. If you talk to Oracle or um, uh, Salesforce, some of these companies, they have their own in-house location technologies. So some of those companies do the integration from the ground up so that everything can understand the location. Uh, location dimension when they do the whole BI aspect of it. And some of the companies depend on uh, third party companies for providing the location intelligence. But again, everybody is trying to provide a unified experience so that for the end user, it doesn't really matter where the location information or location intelligence is coming from. If you're a BI user, all you see is uh, maps and all the location intelligence integrated into the BI application. So from an end of user point of view, everybody is trying to provide a unified experience so that they don't really see whether the BI is coming from one company and the location uh, location intelligence is coming from a different company. But uh, again, depending on how the companies have evolved over the years, some of them do with partnerships and some of them do with the natively. Okay, yeah, no, no, thank you. Um, and I'm going to pick up one more um, sort of technical question and then I'll, I'll sort of draw back to the partnerships piece, if I may. Um, I've got a question here um, asking um, about blockchain and whether yeah. you think that blockchain technology um, is playing or will play a major role in enhancing um, the supply chain. Yep. Uh, so we, we do, we are actually seeing the blockchain technology playing a role in enhancing the supply chain workflows. Uh, so again, from a if you're looking at it from a uh, end user point of view, I don't I don't know if it is actually going to change uh, uh, much from a if you're looking at it from outside from at the B2B stage, they are using blockchain technologies especially to make sure that their vendors comply to certain things and then nothing is getting um, um, corrupted when things get transmitted from one point to another point. 
and then they can verify that when somebody sends something, they can easily verify the status of those things online. So it is improving the, uh, it is definitely improving the workflows, uh, but I, I'm, I don't think it's uh, an externally visible change. Okay, no, no, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I, I suspect it, it, it wouldn't be because um, most people don't understand um, the technology behind blockchain, um, so it's best keeping it yeah. hidden, I guess, from consumers. Um, now, I, I just want to go back to the last the last point you were talking about, which was really interesting um, around partnerships, and I, I want to just focus on the role of government a little bit because you know most governments have got geospatial agencies; they're producing geospatial data to a greater or lesser extent. Um, and to greater or lesser quality. But I'm just trying to see how you see the collaboration uh, between industry and government um, in helping deliver better um, geospatial elements to digital solutions that companies are providing. Yeah, so these days, as you, as a, also one of the previous speakers also mentioned, if you look at the road network level data, a lot of these companies like Amazon and Google, they are, all, they are collecting their own data. So whenever they have, um, Amazon, for example, when they do the deliveries, they are collecting address data. And then, so before they used to buy new postal address information from the US post office. Now, when they do the deliveries, they collect that information on their own. So they don't depend on the government for those kind of things anymore. So, so those kind of street level network collection, those kind of things, a lot of these companies are doing on their own. But if you look at the global scale, for example, now US is going to uh, run some uh, missions to uh, collect uh, 3D data, uh, point cloud data for the whole country to a very high degree of accuracy. So as one of the previous um, uh, speakers mentioned, they actually need the elevation data so that they can understand exactly how the electrical vehicles can be, uh, know, how electrical vehicles will, can preserve the energy when they're going down the slope. So that kind of information at a global scale, at the country scale, will come from these government-sponsored projects. Right. So, so that's why there is a role for government to provide that kind of national-level data so that companies can uh, use that information. But more at the street-level kind of data, but companies themselves are collecting that information because they drive the trucks, those look at, they can put the sensors in the trucks and then they can collect that kind of information. So there is a role for both. So it depends on um, what kind of technology, what kind of data people are using. And I guess it actually um, opens a, a, a door there, doesn't it? Because um, for, you know, in the past, geospatial agencies may have sold data to the um, private sector. Well, now the private sector might have that data that can be purchased or used by the government sector, you know, in their national databases. Um, yep. and, and that addressing example is a really good one. Yeah. Um, uh, you, you talked a lot about um, open architectures um, and, and I'm just the practicality as opposed to the theory of open architectures and some of the other open aspects, the, the open standards to enable interoperability and all of these things. Um, it, it, it's it's absolutely, um, I think everyone will agree, it's, it's where we want to be, but how practical is it to achieve? Do you see it happening, industry working together to, to, to help that happen? Or do you think um, there are frictions and it, it may be very difficult? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, it's a very good question. So so if you look at uh, existing systems or the uh, systems that are there in the past five, ten years, they are, even though they try to build them on an open architecture, they are monolithic systems. Everybody has their own IT department and every IT department runs their own application or whatever. So even if you take like simple uh, in the supply chain management systems, even if you just take very standard applications like ERPs and CRMs and those kind of things. Every IT department runs their own. So pretty much everybody is controlling their own data flow, right? So now, but from there, from those monolithic systems, now if you go to these um, cloud-based systems, just the fact that you are going from a on-premise, your own data center to a cloud-based system, that itself opens it up to a much open architecture. Just, just by going to a cloud-based system. Because now your cloud-based systems, a lot of the times so they are built 
open using architectures. They have web interfaces, they have web service APIs, which are access controlled. So everything is much easier to share when you go to a cloud-based system. So that's why the migration has to happen from on-premise to cloud-based systems. And if that happens, that is going to happen. It's just a question of time, right? Whether it's going to happen next year or the next five years. Once that happens, once everybody is on a some kind of a cloud-based system, then all of this open integration, open base, open standards-based integration, all of that will become much easier to do. And that will definitely happen once you go to that. It's much okay. harder to achieve that in a on-premise system, but it's a uh, hundred times easier to achieve that in a cloud-based system. Okay, yeah, that 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 that's a really good answer, um, or very easily understood answer. Um, and and I think actually it also points to why standards organisations um, can't be insular anymore. They've got to work with some of these big global, um, uh, you know, W3C and, and other organisations to, to think in terms of um, the cloud, um, the wider internet, and not specifically honing in on just geospatial i think there's a there's a, yeah. a much greater interaction needed from standards organizations there okay um there there, there are no new questions um in here so um i'd just like to um close with a bit more of a discussion about government and the role of government um you, you know from and this can be from an oracle or wider perspective but but where do you see in order to actually um improve um logistics and the supply chains the things we've been talking about today where do you think government should play a part um what sort of policy areas should it perhaps focus in on um uh, thinking data thinking um policies around you know digital di the digital environment um, wh where do you think government could play a part to actually open up the market more and, and improve the customer experience um, to improve the customer experience uh, to specifically to improve customer experience or in the overall scm no i i think it's overall scm but ultimately, so that you know, so 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 the society benefits. I'm just trying to see where you think government has a role yeah. in in in, yeah. in in SCM. Okay, yeah, I'm not sure if government has because a lot of the data today has, comes from mostly from private companies these days for SCM these kind of things. So maybe government can provide more. Um, uh, so so one thing is um, especially in SCM, there are a lot of. Um, geographies are involved if you look at the whole supply chain uh, pipeline and if there are uh, regulations that uh, hinder the movement of goods from one place to another or at least to have um, those kind of regulations are easy to understood so that people can uh, understand the whole workflow better because we have seen right sometimes um, if you want to send one particular goods from one place to another place there might be regulation related delays it's the government can work to eliminate those delays or it can reduce those kind of delays so that uh, you know that, that won't hinder your whole global supply chain okay now i understood that so so from a sort of um from a technology um perspective there's not really anything government can, can add value to it, it's more um, from yeah, that sort of at least um, yeah from my experience i don't i don't yeah. think so but more about regulation those those places it can yeah. definitely play a role Oh no, that's very interesting. Thank you very much for that. Okay, well, I'm I'm going to um, wrap up with this one by um, Siva. Thank you very much for um, taking time to be with us today, um, and and for your insights, um, which have been very helpful. And and I'm really pleased actually with some of what you've said because it does it it does fit in with some of our thinking with. Um, the, the GKI, um, particularly this business about us needing to move geospatial right into that sort of wider digital environment. So geospatial becomes part of all digital development, um, yeah. not seen